Uh, technicians Future Wave 2024. Um, I trust that you all had a restful evening. Uh, I'm looking forward to exploring all of the all of today's content. Uh, today is a particularly special uh, day as we have the honor of hosting a keynote speaker who is at the forefront of one of the most revolutionary fields of our time, quantum computing. As we delve into the world of quantum computing, research projects between industry and academia. Let's embrace the immense positivity that this, advancements bring, that this advancement brings to the future workforce. Quantum computing is not just a leap forward, it's a giant leap forward, opening doors to unprecedented possibilities and innovation. What does this mean for all of us, especially those poised to enter or have already entered part of the workforce, or perhaps are reskilling or upskilling? It means a future brimming with promise, where our skills and knowledge become even more valuable as we adapt to meet the demands of this transformative era. It means fostering collaboration across disciplines, forging strong partnerships between academia and industry, and propelling ourselves to new heights of achievement. Our keynote speaker embodies the spirit of optimism and progress. Through the, their expertise and vision, we will gain invaluable insights into how quantum computing research projects are not only reshaping the technological landscape, but are also creating exciting new ventures and career growth opportunities and fulfillment. Please welcome Chief Partnership Officer of the Institut Quantique at Université de Sherbrooke, Ghislaine Lefebvre. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Happy to be here with you today. Uh, will I have a five minute mark uh, before the end? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, yeah, what about quantum computing? I will try to give you a glimpse at uh, what it is, uh, maybe what it's not as well, and try to give you as well uh, a few hints about how we train people and what we envision for the future of quantum computing in terms of workforce. Um, but let's start with, uh, well, the beginning. What about quantum? Have you ever uh, used quantum before? The answer is yes. Uh, you probably used it this morning if you came by car and used your GPS, because GPSs are, uh, well, timed with atomic clocks in satellites, and atomic clocks use quantum in their very way of functioning. So anyone using a GPS is using, at some point of the technology, quantum. Um, then what about... IMR at the hospital. This is actually twice quantum because you need quantum materials to produce the intense magnetic field in this like giant uh, circle back there. A and then it's also quantum because it will align all the spins in your body. And this spin alignment, well, spin is a quantum property of matter in this, uh, in this very particular uh, example. It's, uh, well, the spins of protons that are aligned. And then this is quantum as well. Um, what about lasers? Lasers used in uh, communications uh, these days in optic fibers uh, at the grocery store. I mean, you cannot explain lasers if you don't understand quantum mechanics. So quantum has already well, changed our lives. And this is what we call the first quantum revolution. Um, and of course, I have this last example of the first quantum revolution. Uh, technology here, of course, the transistors. You all use cell phones, you all use computers. And well, in order to explain how the transistors work, you have to understand quantum mechanics. So this is the first quantum revolution. Um, we term it this way because it's, uh, when we understood what quantum was and we use quantum to explain the physics of these technologies. The difference with the second quantum revolution is now we can control some of these properties and this control brings us new ways of thinking about technology and new uh, technological devices that we build. And of course, among them, there's the quantum computer. Um, actually, there's four main ways uh, that quantum is being researched these days. Uh, you have the first one, which is, well, the quantum computer itself. Uh, well, big spoiler here. Um, 
the quantum computer does not work yet. Uh, so we have prototypes. We do send codes to these prototypes. We have results back. They are very noisy. And we can't actually get a quantum advantage right now out of them. Um, but this is, this is an active field of research. And I will jump into this field uh, more uh, in depth in this uh, presentation. Um, then quantum materials. I've already mentioned the superconducting materials that was in the I IMR. Um, now there is... Uh, uh, also other um, quantum materials that we can think of. Some are topological. So you think of the surface of some ma materials that will bring uh, new ways of, uh, well, again, uh, controlling the, the matter there. And you get, ex uh, well, exotic properties that you can exploit. Um, so this is a very, very active field of research. Actually, I think Squansic, it's the oldest of all these fields of research, more than 45 years. Um, now, quantum communication. Quantum communication will bring safety to all uh, quantum, well, to all communications that we have. Uh, quantum communication, this is actually taking place right now. We have a loop of optical fiber that will be devoted to, uh, well, quantum communication uh, in Sherbrooke. It will be linked to uh, some places in Montreal, uh, probably by the end of this year. And Quebec City will be in the, will be in the loop as well uh, before the end of next year. Um, so quantum communication is also something of interest right now. So it's technology that is being uh, developed as we speak. Um, and finally, quantum sensors. This is also a technology that is uh, being, uh, well, transferred to uh, commercialization uh, as we speak. Uh, we have a great example with uh, SB Quantum uh, in Sherbrooke. This is a spin-off from the university, uh, and they are working on magnetometers uh, that are more precise than any classical magnetometers. So for measuring uh, the magnetic field of the Earth or, or uh, from, um, well, buried structures or um, like uh, eventually ores uh, if you want to uh, find new mines and all. So as, so, uh, as soon as you need some very, very uh, sensitive sensors, so magnetometers, there's also gravitometers to, to measure the uh, gravity field, and, uh, and there's others. Um, then this is a very active field as well and closer to commercialization than quantum computing uh, can be. Um, but now, what will slow down the, well, this advent of the second quantum revolution? Uh, it actually is expertise. Um, well, quantum is hard, it's complex, but the people that can understand it and that can shape these new ideas and develop the technologies, uh, there was not that many right now. And well, you can see from the last years, a few uh, quotes that we uh, gathered from the internet. Um, so we need more people uh, in the field. And this is uh, really what we focus on at uh, Institut Quantique. Um, Institut Quantique, so it's a research institute based on uh, University of Sherbrooke. It's on the main campus. Uh, we are eight years old now. Uh, well, the quantum research, as I said before, uh, at University of Sherbrooke is more than 40 years old. Uh, but the institute itself is uh, about eight years old. Um, at Einstein we have this new uh, building uh, for two years now. Uh, if you ever come to Sherbrooke, come visit us. It's, uh, it's worth it uh, in terms of see how research is done uh, in like, again, a very uh, modern uh, way of doing things. Um, the Institute, it's a, of course, a center for having people from very diverse background coming in. There's more than 250 students uh, that are uh, throughout uh, now 42 uh, research groups. Uh, about half of these research groups are in physics and the other half are from six other departments and it's a total of four faculties that are represented at the Institute. So we have uh, people from chemistry, math, computer science, uh, engineering, uh, politics and finance as well um, because we need all these people to look at quantum with their different and diverse backgrounds and we have all these people coming together and work on collaborative projects and this is really uh, the heart of well I'll say any research institute and it is particularly true for uh, Institute Quantic. Um, so you see a few uh, numbers here that characterize us. Um, and uh, yeah, I won't go into uh, much more details, just saying that uh, with a CFREF grant, we've been able to uh, launch in Squantic about uh, eight years ago. And this is how you see these uh, numbers of $132 million, uh, among others that have been, uh, well, that provided the funding for launching uh, the whole journey. Um, 
Well, in Squansic in Sherbrooke, uh, this is where the, well, I'd say more fundamental research take place. But then there's not just in Squansic. Uh, you may have heard of the Quebec government launching what they call the innovation zones. Uh, that was a bit above uh, two years ago. Um, the two first zones that were announced were in Bromont in microelectronics and in Sherbrooke uh, in quantum. Um, the third one has just been announced last fall. It's the Valley de la Transition Energetique in uh, between Shawinigan, Trois Rivières, and Bécancourt. Uh, those is, uh, this is for energy transitioning. Um, Sherbrooke decided to propose its candidacy for quantum, which is quite bold for a city uh, saying, okay, we will position ourselves as the city in quantum in the old province. Um, so it's been accepted. And since then, there was already a, a pretty like dynamic ecosystem there. But since then, it grew uh, quite fast and it's still uh, growing. Um, you can see, uh, well, on the top, right corner, I'll say, in Squantic with the tree IT and C2MI. So this is where the research take, takes place. Uh, we start with uh, more fundamental research. We can prototype at tree IT, which is uh, in the engineering uh, faculty. Uh, we can, we have all these facilities to, to fabricate the devices we want to test uh, at, at C2MI, which is in Bromont, we can scale up for commercialization uh, any device that we uh, produce in the two other institutes. Um, then we have established quantum companies. One qubit is Vancouver based, have uh, offices in Sherbrooke for uh, a bit above uh, four years now. Uh, Pascal, a French company that works on a well special type of quantum computers uh, based on uh, rubidium atoms. Um, they now have offices in Sherbrooke and we, they will fabricate their quantum computers for uh, the North American continent uh, from Sherbrooke. So this is uh, taking place right now. They are, uh, well, building uh, the, their facility as we speak. Uh, and IBM Quantum, uh, we've been partnering with uh, IBM for more than four years now at Instituantic for the quantum software part. Uh, and with uh, IBM, like in general, we've been partnering with them for much, much uh, longer than that. But for the quantum computing part, um, more than four years now, uh, they also have a IBM Quantum System 1, which is uh, one of their largest quantum computers installed in Bromont uh, in their facility over there. It's the fourth IBM quantum computer in the world that is outside of the US territory. So after South Korea, Japan, Germany, the fourth one is in Bromont, uh, and we have access to this quantum computer. Uh, we have a series of startups, either uh, coming, coming from the university or uh, that are uh, Spanish-based, Multiverse. Uh, they also have offices in Toronto. And Qubit Pharmaceuticals, this is a French startup that, uh, that now has uh, offices in Sherbrooke as well. Um, and I won't go over all the details for the other parts, uh, maybe just saying that um, in terms of infrastructure, I will talk to you a bit more about the Quantum Algo Lab because, I mean, this is what I know the most about. Um, so at Instituantic, we have what we call uh, the Quantum Algo Lab, which is our platform of eight quantum software developers. Um, we are there to do research in quantum computing uh, and support research uh, that use quantum computing uh, in various fields. So we right now work with people in chemistry, computer science, uh, geomatics, biology, finance, and more. Um, and the team is there to help the students understand what quantum computing is and to design the various projects that are good projects for, uh, well, tech, well to, for research in quantum computing. Um, so this is, uh, well, the, the, the project that I've been hired for four years ago, and it grew quite a bit from, uh, well, two quantum software developers to eight now. Um, the Quantum Algo Lab is based on three pillars. Uh, I just talked about research. So this is really what we aim, what aim for because, of course, we are a research institute. Um, so, of course, we want to do research, uh, in this case, uh, in quantum computing on the software part. We also have some research, I think, Squantic on the hardware. But at Algo Lab, it really is focused on software. Um, but to do that, as I said before, uh, quantum computing is pretty hard. Uh, we have to rethink the way we think of about computing. I, I always say we have to reprogram the programmers. Uh, you have to think differently. You have to think based on quantum mechanics. Um, so it's not the language itself that is hard because we program mostly in Python, which is pretty uh, like common language for programming. Um, so it's not the language itself. It's the way we use the computer that changes and, and it, it changes drastically. Um, 
So to do that, we have to, well, build a community because there is not enough of us. So we have to, uh, well, have a larger community. And we have many, many initiatives on that. I will come back to this a bit later. Um, and we have to train people. We have to have more people understand what quantum computing is. And we have many, many, uh, well, initiatives on that front uh, as well. I'll come back at the end uh, with some examples. Um, but if we talk a bit more about research and what quantum computing is, I won't go into the, all the details, but just to give you a kind of an overview, a kind of an understanding of why we look at it. I, I just said uh, before, it does not work yet. So why do we <laughs> uh, do that on, well, our daily work? Um, that's a good question. Uh, let me present you the team. Uh, well, we have a few uh, members that are not there because they just joined uh, and we've not taken a new photo uh, yet, but uh, they will be uh, pretty soon. So this is part of the part of the team, I'll say. Um, and and quantum computing, um, yeah, it won't it won't replace classical computing. Uh, I mean, what classical computers do well today, it will do well in the future. So it won't change that part. Uh, but there is some uh, bottlenecks that quantum, that classical computers have. And for some specific problems, quantum computers will be able to help the way we compute information. Um, and not just a little bit. It's not just uh, a new server that we would like uh, wire to our main uh, device. It really changes everything. If uh, we can tackle the way uh, quantum computers work, it will be exponentially faster for these specific problems. What problems are of interest? Um, well, you can see many here. Uh, finance problem problems are of interest. Uh, the finance sector will be impacted by quantum computing. Um, and this is why we have a few projects with uh, uh, finance uh, researchers right now. Um, of course, energy, uh, you can think of many, many uh, others uh, in this uh, in this whole, uh, well, series of industries here. Uh, but you see kind of a, how, um, how people are thinking or where the people that are thinking about quantum computing, uh, well, where they're from right now. Um, so I said that quantum computing will be uh, useful for very specific problems. There is three main uh, domains we think uh, it will be like useful for in the next like, probably 5, 10, 15, 20 years, so like in the medium term. Um, it's optimization. Uh, there is some ways we can think of quantum computing for helping optimization problems. Not all optimization problems, but many of them. Um, quantum machine learning is another active uh, field of research. And the one that is probably the, the lower, lowest hanging fruit is quantum modeling. So taking quantum environments like materials, like uh, designing uh, new drugs, like uh, physics of uh, high energy, uh, all these fields, uh, they are quantum in nature and they fit well uh, in terms of mapping these problems on a quantum computer. And this is why we say it probably is the lowest hanging fruit in all of these fields. Uh, but of course, you have noticed that there is a fourth field here in a different color. Uh, this is the quantum internet. So why is it in a different color? And I said that there's only three. Yeah. Well, you may have heard that if the quantum computer works, uh, this computer will be able to break the uh, current RSA encoding that we use like all the time on the internet. Um, so the RSA encoding is based on this idea that it is very difficult to take a very long uh, number and uh, find its primes uh, factors. Uh, so this is a hard problem, and this is because it's a hard problem that we say that internet right now is safe. But the quantum computer will be able to factorize large numbers into their primes very easily, and we already know the algorithm that will be able to do that. Um, so in this case, the quantum computer is the threat. And there is some ways we can think of uh, for protecting ourselves. There is right now a lot of research in that field. Uh, the NIST, so the standard um, organization in the US, is already working on many uh, well, new ways of uh, encrypting information. Uh, there is, uh, well, three or four protocols right now that are under like intense investigation. Uh, and there is more and more that are proposed every year. And uh, that started many years ago and it is in process so that we can protect our data that is like right now available uh, with uh, encoding that will protect us from eventual quantum computer attacks. 
So in this case, the quantum computer is not the answer, it's the threat. And this is uh, why we won't take it if, uh, in, well into the domains of quantum computing, just because um, this is not uh, what interests us at uh, Algolab, but it's not because it's not of interest. It, we have to think about it. Uh, uh, people think about it, and we have to find ways, uh, either classical or quantum. There's classical solutions, there's quantum solutions for that, um, and there's active research uh, on that field. Um, if I give you a few examples of projects that we worked on uh, before, we partner with the Bank of Canada uh, to, uh, that was a, a fun project. It was uh, to see, okay, the bank has to deliver these new bills to their regional facilities before they are distributed to uh, the various banks throughout the country. Um, so the idea is to have the best routing for the truck. Uh, so it's not just a traveling salesperson problem. It also is a knapsack problem because the truck itself has a finite volume. So you cannot put more than X number of new bills in the truck because it will just <laughs> like uh, f uh, f uh, spill out. Um, so how do you plan your routing with this finite volume and trying to find the best way to minimize the distance that you will run? Um, so that was an optimization problem based on the, an algorithm that we call QAOA, the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. Um, and if you are interested in more uh, details about this project, I can talk to you uh, well after the, the presentation, of course. Um, other examples, we worked with the RDC, so our uh, defense uh, research and development uh, for Canada uh, organization. Uh, we worked with them on a roadmap for adoption of quantum computing. That was a few years ago. Um, and uh, of course, the RDC is very interested in knowing how to use quantum computing and how to make it uh, a reality into, into their, uh, well, daily uh, work. Um, we also worked with uh, Statistics Canada. That was a quantum machine learning project that uh, explored three ways of uh, classifying text. Um, the pretext, and I will say pretext, was to uh, well, uh, differentiate uh, the text from barcodes uh, used in uh, grocery stores. Um, and uh, the, the, the idea here of the pretext is that whatever the data, today there is no quantum advantage, again, of, uh, well, using the quantum computer. But the idea is to see what would be something interesting and what would be scalable once we have a, well, fully functional quantum computer. Um, so that was, a, well, a short six-month uh, project. Uh, very interesting. We uh, learned a lot with them. And the idea Idea right now again is to learn uh, and eventually design new algorithms. Um, with Lockheed Martin, oh, that project was uh, pretty close to the core of the quantum computers. Um, right now, the quantum computers they don't work for long. Uh, after a very short period of time, we lose the quantum coherence. Uh, so that means that we lose all the quantum information that we store in the computer. Uh, and when I say it's short, I, I mean it's a few hundred, uh, hundreds of microseconds. So it's not yet the millisecond uh, long. So it's very fast computation. Um, and we need to apply all our logic to the, the qubits, the, uh, well, quantum bits. So it's the, uh, uh, the, the quantum information unit uh, within the, the, the quantum computer. Um, and we have to be very, very efficient in doing so. And if we want to manipulate the qubits, we have to be efficient as well. And by working on the pulses that we send to the qubits, we can uh, be more efficient than less uh, with uh, native uh, pulses. Um, so that project was to find new ways of optimizing the pulses. We used some machine learning for that. Um, and we've been able to, uh, well, have a duration that was up to 73% shorter than uh, what was originally there. That means that we could uh, manipulate more of the, these quantum gates and have a deeper circuit, um, which is what we are looking for right now. Um, with Thales, uh, well, we have a project right now with them. Uh, that was uh, the, well, small project that was just before. Uh, it was a time series classification. The idea was to uh, look at quantum machine learning approaches using reservoir computing. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, it was uh, really just for starting a project with them, a small six-month project that we knew was just a bridge to this larger one right now that we are working with them. Um, it's a project right now in, uh, well, detecting anomaly in 
uh, communication, communication signals. Um, and so, yeah, it gives you kind of an idea. I don't want to go in more details into all of these specific projects, but I wanted to give you an idea of what is the type of project that we can work on right now in quantum computing. Um, and as you can see, uh, we do that either with uh, researchers within the university or we do that with uh, external partners as well. Um, that is a project that we had with uh, finance researchers at the university. Um, and uh, well, if you want to have more details again, I invite you to come to see me uh, at the break and I can talk to you uh, more about this one. Um, I told you before, we have three pillars uh, at the Algolam. So research is one, very important. Uh, we have also building a community and training that is very important to us. Um, this is on the training front. Uh, we have many workshops that we deliver. Um, the intro workshops that you can see here, so number one and two, uh, have been uh, delivered to, well, various CGEPs throughout the province. Uh, for four years now, we've met with more than 1,000 and a few hundred uh, students. Um, we also have delivered these workshops in uh, the industry. You can see a few of the partners we've worked with uh, before. And number three to six uh, right now are more in, uh, well, intermediary level uh, workshops that we also have, uh, well, uh, built. Uh, we have more advanced material, but the more advanced material so far has been just delivered to uh, university students, so either at Sherbrooke or in other universities. Um, but the idea, again, is to, uh, well, have more students understand quantum computing, at least be introduced to what quantum computing is. Uh, and the same with industry partners. When the uh, partners are interested in knowing what quantum computing is, well, we have to find a way to help them understand, to train their people. Uh, and this is a, a, go a good way to do so. Um, other than that, um, well, a very important, uh, well, task that we have is to manage expectation. Uh, people are excited about quantum computing because it is an exciting field. Uh, we are like very, very happy of doing that again every day of our lives. Um, but because the quantum computers don't work yet, we have to be realistic about what uh, we uh, hope from them on the short term at least. Um, so right now, Quantum computing is a strategic initiative. Uh, you won't have no return on investment on a one or two year horizon as we're used to in uh, high tech. Um, it probably is uh, more five, uh, no, not five, 10, probably 10 and more. Uh, and I say 10 and more for four years now, just to tell you uh, what we, where we stand. <laughs> um, so this is on the hardware front. Then the second part here on the software front, there is so much to uh, well work on. There's so much to discover. There's so much to put in place. We know many primitives. We know many algorithms, but not everything has been uh, well discovered or invented yet uh, and that we have to uh, work on as well and finally because quantum com computing is hard and complex we have to uh, train our people and have people ready for when the hardware will be there and ready to be used um, and to do so, we have what we call our pipeline of talent and we thought of a pipeline to, well, picture it as you can see. <laughs> Um, and we divided it, uh, well, on the long term, mid term, and short term. So on the long term, we go to high schools and CGEPs. Um, this is the project that we call Curieux Quantique. We also, with Curieux Quantique, have uh, many uh, educational uh, outreach initiatives for the general public. Um, on the mid term at the university, we have a bachelor's degree in quantum information science. Sarah Blanchette uh, here in the room will be uh, on the panel a little later this afternoon. After, uh, this morning uh, and she will tell you all the secrets about the bachelor's degree since she's the executive director of the of this degree um this is actually the first degree in quantum information science uh in french in the world uh and probably something like the fifth one uh all languages accounted for. Um, and we have many graduate studies uh, paths at the university uh, that you can take so that you incorporate some, some quantum uh, into your graduate work. Um, then on the shorter term with the Algolab, we work for, well, individuals uh, that would like to, well, either learn more about quantum computing or that want to reorient their careers. So we have many uh, things that we uh, can do with these uh, professionals. Um, we have a few um, workshops that are intended for engineers that are coming by mid 
uh, April, and every second week there will be uh, other uh, workshops. So if you are interested in that, if you are an engineer, uh, you you are welcome to uh, come to these workshops. Uh, otherwise, uh, well, you saw our offering for industry and government as well, and we have to work on again developing the pipeline of talent. So this is what we do at the university. There's of course many many more uh, well initiatives. Uh, ATS uh, in Montreal has many. Uh, Concordia has some as well, uh, and of course in the rest of Canada, there are many, many things uh, taking place. A very interesting uh, professionalizing master's degree in the UK agri right now uh, that is being uh, put together. Uh, and this is just to name a few, there's more than that. Um, Otherwise, on the community building side of things, uh, well, we have uh, external tech meetings for uh, people that are already into quantum computing. Uh, so this is not for, uh, well, training. This is really is, uh, well, experts meeting experts. Uh, we have an internal tech meeting every week, and then we decided a year ago to open it uh, once a month uh, for our partners as well. And this is where uh, it all takes place, I'll say. Um, we also have uh, people from the industry uh, mostly from the hardware companies that also have some research in uh, the software uh, that come uh, from time to time. Otherwise, it's uh, people with actual research that uh, present their work. Uh, very, very interesting meetings there. Um, but, so we have a Slack channel uh, to accompany that, uh, open house uh, or once a year. Uh, we also have a hackathon, and that I can maybe uh, give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, that was uh, in Sherbrooke last October. We had uh, 93 people from uh, nine companies, 15 team competing. Um, so the morning was to learn about what uh, quantum computing is, and the afternoon was while well, trying to tackle challenges that we threw at them. Um, if you are interested in our next edition of the hackathon, you can contact me uh, at the end of the conference and I can uh, have you on a well waiting list for uh, receiving all the details. It will probably come back next fall uh, exactly for well, for all the details. We don't know yet, but we know it's going to be probably in October. Um, so coming again this year. Um, otherwise, we also have worked on uh, educational material uh, that was uh, inted, intended at first for CGEP students, uh, but we've used that uh, in high schools as well and at the university level uh, in intro courses to quantum computing. Uh, the Quantum Enigmas, it's a series, well, right now, right now you see eight different videos. Uh, there's 11 uh, that are now out, and there's a 12th one. Uh, it will be a series of 12 videos. Um, basically, they are animated videos between seven and 10 minutes, um, and we use classical enigmas that we map on the quantum computer, uh, and we solve them using the logic of the quantum logic gates, but without uh, using math and without using Python programming. So it really is just the logic of the gates that is used to, uh, well, introduce how we think differently about quantum computing. There is no quantum advantage in doing so, but it really is a fun way to learn, well, uh, what it may be uh, uh, working on a quantum, quantum computer. Um, and of course, after the, after the series of 12, there is many more uh, resources on the web that you can use. Uh, we also have uh, developed some modules that are uh, interactive, modules or exercises based on the enigmas that we have worked with IBM Skills Build, which is a platform uh, for learning high-tech um, well, fields. There are some things in cloud computing, cybersecurity. Uh, there was not much in quantum computing, and we decided to work with them uh, for working on the, well, for developing these modules uh, based on the quantum enigmas. This is intended for high school students. Um, and we are very proud to say that the Enigmas have been awarded the Canadian Applied Arts Award uh, last year for the quality of their images. Uh, and this is, well, thanks to Studio Nord-Est, a Quebec-based, uh, Quebec City-based uh, studio that uh, works on the, well, all the drawings and the animation for the videos. Um, and with that, uh, well, I hope that you grasp the, grasp the idea that, uh, well, quantum computing is hard and that we have to develop more and more talent. Uh, if you have any question about any of these topics that I covered today, well, you're welcome to ask them now. Um, my question is, I have two questions, one quick one. Uh, which high school subject do you think is most important 
to building quantum talent in the long run. So if you had to double the investment in one subject like English, chemistry, physics, math for high school students, which one would you choose? Wow, that's a good question. Um, well, quantum computing is based on three pillars. Uh, and well, the name suggested quantum and computing. Uh, so quantum is the physics part, computing, of course, computer science. But then what's the third part? Math. Um, and it really is the three of them that makes up quantum computing. So if I talk about quantum computing, because quantum at large, uh, that may be more physics, but for quantum computing, it really is the three pillars. Um, in the team, most of the people come from, uh, well, two of the three fields, and anyone that came in the team had to learn the third one. And this is what we have to do today, is to really share knowledge, uh, share how we understand quantum. Um, so this is, of course, more advanced than just, uh, well, that, than the high school level that you asked about. Out. But the idea is the same. Um, quantum computing is great for uh, math teachers because there's all the probabilistic approach that they can use and like talk about probabilities in a fun way because quantum computers will use uh, probabilities in how they, they, they function. Um, then, of course, on the physics side, you can introduce some, uh, well, concepts of superposition, entanglement, uh, interference, uh, and so on. So it's, and it's quite, uh, uh, well, enjoyable for students, and they always love it when we, we do so. We have many uh, demos that we bring to high school students uh, as well, um, and it makes it fun to learn about quantum. Um, and on the, well, computing side, uh, I mentioned it briefly with the quantum enigmas. Um, you don't necessarily need to program in Python. You can use what we call the quantum composer. Uh, so composer really is like a music uh, composer. You uh, you start with uh, one line per qubit, and then you uh, simply apply quantum logic gates to your uh, circuit. Uh, and this makes up your algorithm at the end. And you can think of computing using just uh, this composer, which could be kind of an equivalent of scratch in classical, uh, but uh, for quantum. Uh, so there's many, many things you can think of at the high school level uh, while well, uh, well, introducing quantum knowledge. And the second question would be, um, governments across Canada have been investing in building the quantum talent pool for a while. I know that there's the Quantum Algorithms Institute in at SFU, um, and that's been going on for a few years now. What's been the most surprising challenge in building the talent pool that none of you guys saw come in? Uh, the most, uh, well, the greatest challenge in uh, training would be uh, everything. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, Having interest from the students, this part is kind of easy, I'll say, because uh, again, we can introduce uh, in a fun way what quantum computing is. Um, but even with the, the quantum enigmas, for example, I always tell that quantum enigmas are the second step in quantum computing. So first step is to learn what is a qubit, uh, what superposition, entanglement, interference are. Uh, so these uh, like are really the building blocks of uh, the quantum computer. Uh, and then once you grasp kind of an idea of what all that is, then you can, well, use the, the quantum enigmas. But then very soon, what you will face is the complexity of the math that goes behind it, of the, the programming that will accompany this math. Uh, and of course, uh, what you have to do is figure out how can you uh, maximize, well, the NISC systems that are the near-term intermediate scale quantum computers. So the, these systems that are very noisy that we have right now. Um, or the other thing you could, you could, well, the other path you could use is to say, okay, I won't bother about NISC. Uh, I'm not interested in just trying to get out, uh, well, things from something that, well, does not work anyways. And I will work for the fault tolerant quantum computer that will come in a few years or decades from now, uh, but then you will work only on theoretical material. Maybe you will be able to send a few lines on simulators, uh, but classical simulators past 50 or 100 qubits, they are not well working anymore. Uh, you have to uh, have all these approximations uh, taking place. And this is why, I mean, the actual quantum computer will be so much more powerful than the classical computers for these uh, calculations is because it will be uh, well presenting an exponential advantage or well runtime over the, uh, the, the 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 classical computer. So you can't simulate with a classical computer what will be better on a, on a, a quantum computer. Of course, at some point there is a limitation there. Yeah. Other questions? Can I? Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Sebastien. I'm I've been in the industry of quantum for a year now. 
And I can testify that it's a very different industry, very complex. Um, and uh, congratulations on the presentation. You made it uh, pretty simple. And congratulations on the uh, Institut Quantique. They've been doing a colossal work uh, around the world. I must say it's very uh, respected. Um, now, for people who don't have a science background, who would like to be involved and would like to uh, discover quantum and do projects, what would be your best advice how to uh, address this industry and how to address these projects? Okay. Well, for the research itself, I'll say you need a scientific background. Um, I myself, I'm from science, but not from physics, nor math, nor computer science. I'm from geology, and I'm not doing the research. <laughs> um, so I, I, I do evolve in the field of quantum for four years, but with a different role, uh, which is partnerships and also this managerial uh, part of the work with the two teams of the Quantum Algo Lab and Quantum Curious. Um, so for people that are non uh, scientists, I say there is a place, but it won't be in the research itself. It will be in other very important roles, but it will be in roles that are revolving around, uh, well, the research. The, for the research, you'll need to be, uh, again, scientist, and, and you have to, uh, well, go deep into the, the physics of it and, and into the science of it, yeah. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Jislyn, for a beautiful presentation. I was not expecting to see the procession of spins, so I was really excited. Um, but something that I've been really impressed by the University of Sherbrooke is their commitment to sustainability. Like, they've been number one, really innovative with their innovation park. If the quantum computer is successful, what will be the impacts or ties to sustainability? Uh, can, can you repeat the, the last part, yeah. please? Yeah. If the quantum computer is successful, yeah. how does it relate back to sustainability of the environment? Okay, okay, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, uh, well, there are many, many, many ways we can think of using the quantum computer for sustainability. Right now, there is an international working group in sustainability that has been, that has been put together uh, by IBM. Um, we are part of the, uh, well, the founding members of this group as well. Uh, there's Pink, the platform that uh, well manages the IBM Quantum System One. It's a nonprofit uh, that is based here in Quebec, but it's for uh, whole Canada for accessing the IBM Quantum Systems. Um, so they, they are part of the working group as well, and there's many other organizations. Uh, and the idea is to, well, look at how exactly that question can be answered. So how can we use a quantum computer for sustainability purposes? Right now, we have projects in, uh, I, I'll give you more, uh, well, detailed examples here. Uh, we have a project in uh, in biology that looks exactly at that. So th the idea is to see how can we use the quantum computer for uh, biology or ecology problems uh, that are not possible to tackle with classical computers these days. Um, we have projects in chemistry that go along these lines as well. Uh, it's in quantum materials. So how can we design better materials uh, for batteries, for example? And this is something that, again, the quantum computer will be good at uh, in terms of capacity. Um, and uh, well, and there's others. I, I, th I think of geomatics, for example. You can think of uh, well, prediction modeling of uh, well, natural disasters, and this is the type of things that quantum uh, well could help uh, at some point in the in the time. Um, so there is many many things, and many many ways we can think of it. So yeah, the university is engaged in this sustainability uh, well process, uh, and quantum computing is part of well, the tools that we have or, well, hope will be helpful to, to pursue that goal. Yep. Well, I guess that's it. So, well, thank you very much, everyone, for attending this morning. And, uh, well, if you have other questions, I'll be here at the break. Well done. Thank you. When I talk to young people, the conversation usually goes something like, had I known then what I know now, I would have become a cybersecurity expert. Did I say that to you last night, Anthony? Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> well, let's uh, add uh, quantum computing to that list. Um, just one quick housekeeping item before we move on and while they set the stage for the next panel.
we are uh, live streaming this event, so it is recorded. So if you happen to be walking towards the back of this room, try and duck around the camera. And please do try to avoid the center aisle if possible. All right, so we're bringing uh, three panels to you this morning before we have lunch and then begin our networking event sponsored by Seawill. First up, get ready to fortify your digital defenses as we dive into the world of cybersecurity. Did you know that statistics predict that cybercrime will cost the global economy more than 20 trillion, I have to make sure it wasn't billion, but trillion US dollars by 2026? And that's 1.5 times increase compared to figures in 2022. So it's a staggering figure, and I find that it really underscores the critical importance of staying ahead in this ever-evolving landscape. So prepare to um, hear from our panel of uh, cyber cybersecurity experts who will discuss the secrets of safeguarding our digital future. Um, come on up, uh, Rushmi uh, Hashem, Kevin Dawson, J. Paul Haynes, Andrew Buckles, and Anthony Androli. Good morning, everyone. Is this working? Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Kevin Dawson, uh, President and CEO of uh, IC Cybersecurity, and I'll be moderating today's discuss discussion. As well, I'll be a timekeeper. So I have my phone in front of me only from a timekeeping standpoint, but I trust the uh, Technation team will keep me on time as well. And uh, I'm excited to be here today to talk about uh, uh, how we go forward and, and how the cybersecurity skills gap and AI and these things come together. I'm uh, very excited to have on the panel with us uh, a mix of, of other industry veterans as well as academia uh, to carry on this conversation. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll pass the panel down to the end at, uh, and allow uh, Anton Joe oh, to introduce yourself. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me? That sounds good. Okay, great. So my name is Anthony Andrioli. I'm doing my PhD at Concordia University. In particular, I'm studying uh, vulnerability detection in binary code. So we usually look for vulnerabilities in IoT devices. Um, just to let you know why I'm here, uh, we threw a hackathon, a CTF hackathon, Capture the Flag, uh, this past weekend at Concordia. And it was co-hosted by Technation. And so Tim said, hey, would you be interested in coming on this panel? And I said, of course. So that's why I'm here. And I really appreciate everyone coming out to uh, give me a chance to make it on this panel with these big shots. So thank you. It's great to have someone who gets their hands dirty on a panel, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm Jay Haynes, a uh, president and CEO of eCentire. Uh, eCentire um, is uh, sort of credited with creating a new category in cybersecurity a number of years ago called managed detection response. We spent many years uh, challenging the way managed security was delivered. Um, and, and had great success and now find uh, three or 400 companies in that category globally. So the whole idea of what we do is um, we look at, uh, um, we call it threat management, but something that has actually bypassed all the perimeter controls in an organization is now potentially a threat that needs to be investigated and mitigated. Most companies don't have the teams to do that 24-7. We started uh, in the mid-market and finance, which you see is a big sector, and quantum as well. And um, and now we find ourselves in pretty much every sector around the world. So it's, uh, and the problem is moving up markets. So the enterprises are now recognizing they have the same challenge. And you know, one might have said originally, and, and part of why I, I think I'm on the on the panel here, was asked to be on, was um, the, well, there's a skills crisis, and, and that applies to the small companies, the medium companies. Well, it actually applies to everyone now. So so I think there's uh, some interesting perspectives I can share from, from our challenges in hiring people and working with folks like you. So I'll hand it right over to you. Thank you. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Rashmi Hashem, Director of Workforce Training at Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst, Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly Ryerson University. Uh, we are the university's non for profit National Center for Cybersecurity. And one of the things that we did in our early days was to engage with eCentire and other like minded uh, industry. Um, 
you know, leaders and being able to understand who is not represented in cybersecurity and what were the skills that were needed. And this was five years ago. And so we started to identify these gaps and we started to realize women, new Canadians, individuals who had been displaced from non-traditional tech sectors such as hospitality were not being represented in cyber. And we started to build workforce training programs, rapid reskilling programs. And now we, as a National Center for Cybersecurity, also uh, accelerate businesses in cyber. We work in corporate training across the country, working with corporations in upskilling, and we've trained over a thousand individuals uh, into, into many, many jobs across the country. So thank you for inviting me, and uh, we're really excited. I'm excited to be here because East Centaur was one of the reasons why uh, we started our uh, center. I don't have a mic. Yes, Thanks. <clears throat> Good morning, and thank you to Tech Nation for inviting us. I'm, I'm Andrew Buckles. I'm the cyber services owner at uh, ISA Cybersecurity. Uh, what we do is we help Canadian organizations of all shapes and sizes uh, understand the controls that are required within their cybersecurity program. Uh, cybersecurity is not a one-size-fits-all problem. Every business is unique and has different types of challenges. So we work with them to assess, understand what their roadmap should look like, what level of sophistication they need in the controls and their control framework, uh, we help them implement those controls, and then we help them manage it day to day. So my team is focused on the delivery side, so I have a whole team of subject matter experts that uh, make me look good every day and help our, our customers uh, keep Canadians safe. So thank you. Great. Thank you, panel. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be down here with a question in a second. But in terms of kicking off, I was, I was inspired a bit by uh, the, the keynote today on, on Quantum. And uh, many in computer field know, know the notion of Moore's law and how the acceleration, there's the, the law of accelerating growth. And I, I can say that nowhere more is there a perfect example of that in the space of cybersecurity, especially over the past five to 10 years. Uh, I've been in the industry for 25 years and I'd, I'd say in the last five years, uh, my, my sleepless nights have gone up exponentially over the previous 15 years in this industry. And so with that, I will uh, I kind of in, in the accelerated growth in, in both the technology space and the threat actors and, and all those other things. Um, that by itself creates a challenge in academia and, and being able to keep up. So my first question, um, kind of what role, and maybe this is, uh, I can ask you, Rashmi, what role does academia play in, in kind of trying to keep up with the rapid change that we're seeing in cyber, um, in, in cyber being leveraged by AI and those things as well? Oh, very big question. Thank you. Uh, academia needs to partner more with industry, first of all, when it comes to designing and starting to look at what training is required because we're filling a unique gap. So there's two aspects of academia. One is the long-term view of the multi-year programs uh, where we want really thoughtful skills, uh, building in analytical skills uh, as we're building out our programs, but we need the input now from industry, from all of you on the panel and everyone here that's listening, uh, because everything's changing. And we look at curriculum change, it's every three months. Something has to be changed, reflected, version updates. Uh, so as industry updates happen or new threats are detected, it has to be a feedback loop. And we are not really good in academia, traditionally, of creating these feedback loops. So we have to make sure that we're listening and responding and asking the right questions. Uh, so that way we can bring it to our students, we can bring it into the classroom and make it move from theory to practical. And that's where the catalyst for us we were able to create, and that's why the university put us on the side. We're not in the actual university. We sit outside the university so we can create programming reflective of the needs of the industry. And I think, and that's why our programs are like fast paced, sprint six months, and you're in the industry. And we're creating a gray space inside academia. And more education institutions are starting to come up and starting to look at our model and starting to respond because we can't do it alone. So I think the more that we listen to the needs and really have our curriculum reviewed and 
we, we, we need this feedback loop and we're not seeing it because we're not getting the engagement from industry. And I'd like to learn how do we invite industry to our tables? Because without that, we're not going to create the talent that Canada needs to be safe. Right. Anthony? Yeah, 100%, you have any? I 100% agree with you. The only thing is I'm just not sure about how we're going to make these things part of the curriculum because the, the it, it, theoretically it's a nice idea, but to actually get these things to happen in the curriculum, okay, there's a lot of uh, things that are going to stop you, like uh, the regulations for creating a new program and so on and so forth. But the other thing you said I think is really uh, important, which is get industry involved with academia. Okay, we have that a lot actually. In, in particular, my lab, we work with the CSE, we work with Talis, we work with Ericsson, uh, we work with Hydro Quebec, and that's where we learn our biggest lessons, right? They have data that we don't have and they give it to us and we can start solving new problems. So the industry can feed us problems, they can feed us data and you know academics, we can survive on meager amount of finance so we can sit there and try to solve these problems over and over until we come up with something and that's actually the name of the game in academia right is to innovate uh, with modern problems so i would agree with that completely yeah, i think one of the uh, things first off uh, you're not like other academic institutions you're in another another uh, uh, league altogether because you do you do a great job of working with the partners as challenging as you might see it the the thing uh, the perspective that is often not understood outside of the industry is you're in a you know a day-to-day -day knife fight uh, with an adversary that has first mover advantage what that means is you have to be uh, you know uh, listening to the signals and and detecting when they've come up with some new uh, methods and those methods are sometimes they're like their, their whole their whole purpose is to basically evade all the methods that can detect and contain them so you have to basically figure out how to trap things that you've never seen before and then take countermeasures so you can't write a course that does that right it's it, so this is the challenge that you have and if you kind of look at the evolution and Kevin will know this one uh, you're know, going to the RSA show which is the annual you know, now 40,000 attendee conference, um, there's every year there's a new kind of threat and there's a new blinky light thing for the data center, right? So there's, I think there's 80 categories now, according to the various analysts. It's a very fragmented industry and, and you have um, very conflicting uh, uh, technology and skill sets required, like just in the research side that, you know, there's a whole body of knowledge and, and thousands of researchers doing just what you do and there's 79 other categories of, of similar complexity but very different so so i think it's important to understand that as part of the challenges that you have uh, you have um, even if you look at engineering inside an organization you have a design statement and a problem and engineers go off and design the solution and and the you know two weeks from when you start that it's already out of date in a sense so you have this is a, a constant challenge we have in the industry if, if there's still time, I, <clears throat> I got a couple of thoughts. You know, JP, you're talking about the whack-a-mole game yeah. that is our industry, and that's very, very true. And, you know, I think, you know, you, you were talking earlier, Kevin, about Moore's Law and this accelerated growth curve, and we're seeing, you know, with AI that Moore's Law is, doesn't even apply anymore because it's starting to actually, uh, technology is growing much more rapidly than it has in the past. Um, I think education is extremely important because cybersecurity is an industry where, it's sitting on top of other things. If you, if you want to be a cybersecurity analyst, or if you want to be a vulnerability expert, if you want to be a, an offensive security specialist, you know, whatever kind of domain you get into within our industry, you need to understand how infrastructure works, how digital systems work, how software works, how does network work, um, and you need to be well-educated. And I think what's happening generally in society is that the systems that we rely upon, whether they're digital or otherwise, they're getting more complicated. And in order to support those systems and to come up with new ideas, and new defense mechanisms as we see new attack scenarios that come out. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a highly educated workforce that can think about these problems and come up with new solutions. Because uh, there is not going to be a blueprint for that next attack scenario. So people are going to have to figure out what are those controls that we need to create to stop those new, new, new attack scenarios. Thank you, that was, that was fantastic. And in that notion, um, the Catalyst is very, very well known for its upskilling. People have a fundamental basis of knowledge when they join your program. It might not be cyber. It might be other things in, their, in the industry. But uh, this is probably a better question for JP and, uh, and Andrew. In kind of how does the how does industry support um, cyber securing uh, emerging workforce that we need to have to do this? And, and you kind of touched on a bit, Andrew, but 
the diversification of skills that are required in that um, to, to support it to support academia and industry. You want me to go first? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, you know, we, obviously, you know, we support uh, academia quite a bit. You know, we we have a partnership with the University of Guelph. We do co-ops with many of the colleges. You know, it's extremely important for our business to be able to support the future workforce to identify new talent to help train that new talent. Um, you know, t typically it takes about six months in a co-op before. Uh, you know, a new student uh, is proficient in being able to support our needs in the business um, and, and creating that future workforce and that talent pipeline uh, is necessary because as our business continues to grow, we have to be able to do that. So how do we do that? How can industry help and support? Well, we participate in programs to do different types of workshops. So it could be offensive security exercises or providing specialists from our team to the universities to help support those higher education programs. Um, the co-op programs are really important as well. Uh, and I think <clears throat> academia can continue to evolve by adding more programs because in our business, you know, there's probably about a dozen or so different specializations. And, you know, when you come into the industry, you, you may be more of a generalist and you can go into different specializations. I think academia can support by offering more of those specializations so that they're coming out of university with uh, some practical skill sets uh, that we can leverage on day one. Yeah, and on your prior comments, uh, it sort of uh, uh, got me thinking about one of the challenges that we see uh, is the base uh, skills of how the, how information technology works, how networks work, how cloud works, how cloud and networks work, how remote offices work, and so forth. And, um, and oftentimes, and this is one of the challenges academia has, is um, they can they bring in um, uh, the raw material, uh, the ball of clay, and then they mold it into a, a, a trained, uh, certified um call it book smart uh, analyst and um we have we've had this this isn't a commentary on on catalyst it's um it's uh, across the board uh we can have folks that'll come in with very high grades but they actually you know we have to teach them what udp is or this is different from tcp which you think is the most fundamental thing and this is very common and and, it's, and it messes up our um our training uh, regime we still like the candidates uh but you know, something that might take three months, all of a sudden it's taking another three that we have to invest in them to get them up to that level. But there's also a, um, and this is where the diversity uh, uh, point I think is quite valid. The, one of the things that makes you very good, at least in, in our, I'll talk about our security operations center where we have uh, probably 150 odd uh, uh, resources that are at level one through level four. Level fours are 10 year plus veterans. Level one is the our version of the ball of clay. When we bring them in, uh, we run them through um, uh, intensive uh, training and certifications. And uh, we have uh, domains that are endpoint and others that are network and others that are cloud and, and logging based. And um, each one of those, we put them through a certification internally on our own training. And every time they achieve one of those, we actually increase their salary. Because one of the challenges that you have is very competitive as an employer. Um, salaries are always, uh, you know, the next the next door neighbor uh, firm is is figuring out a way to scoop your staff. So um, so they they actually increase their salary through five certifications, and then they have enough time in the in the role that they uh, then can be eligible to move up to the level two. That's another salary increase, and then we send them on external training and more certifications. So it's I don't know if anyone's heard the the saying where you know the manager comes to his uh, VP and says. I can't believe you know we have to spend this money on on training these people. What if they leave? And it's what if we don't train them and they stay? Right? You got to think about it that way. With the you know the backdrop of everything is changing all the time. So on the diversity front, the one observation I would make is uh, it's very hard to you know there's no sort of uh, one, um, standard definition. Um, you need somebody that's curious, and they come from every walk of life. Um, someone that's curious, they want to capture the flag. We like to say, or I do, that uh, there's a, you know, one part um, um, air traffic controller, one part network engineer, and one part Fortnite. And we need those three affinities uh, for long-term success because uh, they, they literally are fighting. Uh, it's, like a, it's like a video game in a sense, and they've got to you know, uh, quickly de uh, detect and contain the adversary. So, so the diversity is across... Um, um, all all aspects of of the way people think. That's very uh, very interesting, and it and it almost, in some senses, kind of flies against academia traditionally, where you have specific programs that our our, our, our keynote today talked about mathematics or compute or physics, and, and and typically people in academia pick one stream, and and what you're talking about is almost the notion of a jack of all trades who then comes in and can then specialize on specific areas, but they need to know 
a little bit of all these pieces so they know how they fit together. Very insightful. Thank you very much. So I'm going to switch gear a bit here um, and, and, and open up to the, uh, to the panel to answer. In the notion of uh, uh, this change in, in organizations, how do, we, how do we incentivize? We are all involved in cybersecurity every day, both from an academic and industry standpoint, but a lot of organizations are not. And so how do we incentivize those that are not to, to kind of pick up the torch and pick up the challenge and then integrate cybersecurity into their training, into their platforms, workflow? Uh you can, you can start if you like. Yeah, well, well, you were more oh. ready than I was. Okay, okay. <laughs> Go <First> ahead. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, um, I could say this. So basically, like if you know anything about, let's say, um, the topic of operand conditioning, there's three ways to incentivize. You can punish, you can remove punishment, and then you can reward. And so you have to decide which one of those you want to use or the combination of them to incentivize. Okay. I would opt for reward usually because I've seen the other ones and they don't really work that well. Um, but you can reward companies for doing things like creating bug bounty programs, right? Like Netgear has some of those, right? And they'll give you money if you find vulnerabilities in their products. Um, but if we incentivize those types of initiatives, then I think we're going to be in the right direction because some of these companies don't have these hardcore security practices that we hope they do. And they're not keeping up with all these new pieces of technology and these new services to help um, secure their products. They're just not keeping up. Um, I can just give you a quick example. Um, our lab just finished getting a public disclosure for a bunch of vulnerabilities in Netgear products. Okay, it's on their website now. And those vulnerabilities are extremely embarrassing. It was actually me and my friend who found them. Okay, they're written in the same function. They're very easy to see from a developer's perspective. So why are those vulnerabilities in those products, right? So it's very strange to see these things happen. And I think it's indicating that there is a lack of protection at the most base level. Okay, so that's my comment there. That was very good. I'm glad you went first. <laughs> I'm going to take a little different approach to incentivizing individuals to take up the torch for cyber. And I do want to clarify one point. I'm not academia. So I, I'm not in the academic side uh, at, at all. I get the freedom to create programs without having to go through Senate and approval and creating rapid training programs. Uh, but to incentivize individuals to come into cybersecurity who've never touched it, I think we need to start to appeal to what cybersecurity means to individuals who are not in it. We may see it from a point of view of it's very technical, looking at technical skills, but how do we bring individuals in who are intimidated by these technical ideas and they want to be participating? So one of the things that we do and I do because this is why I'm in cyber is appealing to the fact that cybersecurity is a very human terminology. We've applied human values to cyber. Cybersecurity exists because we need to protect the basics of how our society functions. And we wanna be able to protect our schools, we wanna protect our financial institutions so we can protect commerce, we wanna protect our government so we can protect our democracies. And the minute that you apply very human values to the word cybersecurity, oh my gosh, the interest increases. That's when those stories become real. That's when you have a school teacher saying, I want to go into cybersecurity. I don't know anything about technology. And they enter into a training program. And within six months, that passion drives them because they found their why. And now they're working maybe at East Centire or somewhere at RBC or at Rogers. And they're giving their passion or the chef who's never touched technology before. And she says, I've had enough of being a head chef, but she knows that she wants to be in cyber. And why, and you ask her why, and she says, because I saw a breach happen to my mother. The human values. So the more that we can tell these stories, and the more that we can show the transferable skills, and for the chef it's about, she can see 10 orders down, right? She can predict, I need to organize my kitchen and my team to see 10 orders down, then she's got 
that ability to see 10 threats down, the ability to communicate, the ability to be in the heat in the moment and to be able to stand up and identify where those threats are, what are the solutions. So we need to incentivize society by giving them these stories of human values because cybersecurity is not a technical problem. It requires technical skills. It's a human issue for the way we live. Sorry, I get very passionate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate on the incentive side because um, I do think, you know, it's all about carrots and sticks, 100%. Uh, I think the sticks are a little more important, unfortunately, than the carrots today. Um, so what do we need to incentivize organizations to put in cybersecurity controls when they are not cybersecurity focused? Uh, I think it's legislation, regulation, and legal consequences if they're executing bad behaviors. I think the incentive structures today for many organizations is not aligned to a, a secure posture. Uh, you know, you think about a company, I'm not gonna pick on Netgear, but you know, it was mentioned. Um, you know, the incentive structure for Netgear is to get new features out, new products to market, to try and put those products out on the market that their users are going to pay for, that they want to pay for. Um, well, that's in direct conflict with funding cybersecurity controls. So if the business is left with a decision to put budget towards new features and functions that can help them increase their revenues or put the, the budget towards cybersecurity controls that can make sure those devices that they're creating or that software that they're creating or whatever services they provide to all of us as, as citizens or consumers of those products and services, um, you know, the, there's not, they're not going to make that decision unless they have to. Um, now, the good news is cybersecurity at the end of the day, it's not a technical problem. It is a business problem. It is a risk problem. And without risk, you can't have reward, but organizations need to assess and manage that risk. And, and I think the big problem today is many are not, um, and they don't know what their cybersecurity risk is. Uh, and, if, and that really exposes them to major problems often ending up in the news or impacting us you know, in the services that they provide, whether it's financial services or utilities or uh, you know, retail, whatever that happens to be. So I'm more on the stick side for now, but you know, I think carrots are important too. Um, and I think government can help, especially with the smaller business that maybe can't afford to assess the risk and, and put in some of these controls. Government can play a role by providing programs, educational programs, or subsidizing maybe insurance premiums or you know, things of that nature to help those organizations that don't have the same resources as you know, a national enterprise does. Yeah, I was going to go down the exact same path, the, the stick and the carrot. Um, and what I, we, we built the business around um, uh, working with financial services firms. You know, New York City was the, the main commute uh, for years. Um, and, and basically, um, the industry, everything happens first there. All the newest technologies, the biggest spenders, it all seems to start in financial services. So what we saw evolve there uh, in the carrot and stick context was... Um, the, the highest level regulator in the U.S. is the FFIEC, and under them they have various uh, other uh, legislation. The SEC uh, regulates uh, trading organizations, and what um, was happening was the counterparties, like say the Goldman Sachs or the Citibanks, were uh, were being regulated by FFIEC, and they were actually pushing their regulations down to the um, the smaller financial services firms that that, that are you know trading uh, money and market feeds and everything. So what was happening is they were they were being assessed um, using these like. The, the largest assessment we saw was 1,500 different audit points. You, this is your world, Andrew, right? And, and so 1,500 audit points for a little firm is overwhelming. So what it became was, uh, so the stick was, you can't work with us unless you can get a satisfactory risk score on this, became the carrot uh, in that it was a hunting license. So once you invested in cybersecurity, you now you you now could trade with everybody and you weren't going to be restricted. and. And, and, you know, fast forward, uh, you know, I guess 10 years, uh, there's actually a marketplace that uh, firms get assessed once and uh, the big uh, financial institutions subscribe to this and they see what their assessment is. So, so now you, so there's a whole sub industry just keeping track of what your compliance is. And, and, and so we're seeing this happen in, in other uh, uh, segments as well. But that's, uh, I think that's the, the, the hybrid, the combination of carrot and stick is affected. The, the, the commercial world solves it uh, in their own way, a little bit of regulation um, and, and then the government steps back and lets it uh, take care of itself. 
that's these are all great answers, and they've kind of inspired a couple of things in me because I'm I'm equally as passionate as you, Rashmi, in this area. I think of uh, and, and you went to uh, I think of uh, Simon uh, Sinek's getting to your why, um, and you you talked about cybersecurity and being a very daunting term, and people think it's a technical term, and, and you have to be technical to be in cybersecurity. Um, our why as an organization is quite simply keeping people safe. You, you humanize it and make it about keeping people safe. You used examples of of hospital breaches and now, uh, and we joke because we, we, we are very, uh, we do a lot in the hospital sector as does uh, uh, JP's company. And, and my, my mother, when, before she passed, she, she didn't understand what I did as an industry. And she said, well, it's not like you're saving people. And I'm like, well, in some cases we may be if we're helping to keep uh, the lights on in a, uh, in a hospital. So I'm equally passionate about it in that regard. And, and and you had said, JP, about kind of the industry and, and 200 plus vendors in it. And and the reason I think that is, um, is because it's a, it's a team sport. Like there's that many people because there's that much work to be done. And it really comes down to kind of everyone participating and everyone getting this notion of how do I help keep everyone safe? So I appreciate that. Uh, it was great. One more, another question in, uh, that, that has come up uh, most recently and uh, and uh, it's an interesting one because the topic might have not been talked about as much in the last three years. But the role of um, AI, open AI, or as Elon Musk would like to have it called now, closed AI um, in the last couple of days, what's the role of AI in cybersecurity and, uh, and, and academia? Ooh. Anthony? Oh, sorry, I was watching him. Um, well, look, for generative AI, actually, I used it to generate the answer to this question. So... This <laughs> Um, so basically, from a perspective of um, creating malware, right, it used to be that the attackers had to become innovative by themselves and find ways to um, sort of go over the detection systems, right? So they would find more novel ways to obfuscate their patterns so that the common detection systems couldn't see them. But now they don't have to innovate as much because these generative systems can create that obfuscation and so that's going to cause a big problem in defense because now defense has to adapt much faster to those types of obfuscation techniques, which are above what we were able to, to even conceive of before. So I think the speed of attack and defense is going to increase, which is uh, maybe going to give all of us ulcers. I don't know, but it's a problem in that respect. I think the short answer is to be determined, um, but the longer answer is it's definitely going to have an impact 100%. Actually, JP used a term earlier that I can't remember what you said, but it was effectively there's a, a bigger incentive on the attacker side and the defender. You know, generative AI is 100% going to make it a lot easier for the attacker initially. Um, and if you think about our industry today, you know, the attacker and the defender, the red, you know, the red team and the blue team. Uh, <clears throat> the red team today has to find one vulnerability. And when I say vulnerability, uh, you know, there's a bunch of different types of vulnerabilities. You can find vulnerabilities in people, in process, uh, you know, in uh, organizational structures, in the actual technical controls. You can find technical vulnerabilities in binaries, as an ex you know, where, where Anthony's expertise is. Um, and you just have to find one to get in the door to be able to cause damage and harm or accomplish whatever objective you're looking as, as a red teamer. The blue team has to be right all the time. So if you have hundreds and hundreds of vulnerabilities and you don't necessarily know where they all are because you don't have a very robust control framework to find them all, uh, and the attacker can use generative AI to find all of those vulnerabilities quickly and effectively and target the ones that are the highest risk, you know, this is going to create a, a bit of a Pandora's box where the attacker will be much, much, much more successful than the defender over the next few years. So there's going to be tools that will come out to help the defender but I think that those are gonna lag on the attacker side. And we're already starting to see it. You know, there was an uh, organization, I think in Hong Kong, uh, where there was a video, a video call that was st stood up uh, and they were extorted out of $35 million or the equivalent of 35 uh, million Canadian dollars. And nobody was real on that call, but they were all mimicked of employees. And that's an example of a vulnerability. You know, they're not exploiting that poorly written code on software, um, but they understood that this particular person that they were targeting had some authority to make decisions and they knew who that person was connected to. They knew their team members, they knew what they looked like, they had their voices, 
They knew what kind of language that they were going to use when they got onto a call, uh, and they tricked it, and they tricked them to uh, you know wire money or uh, and it cost the business quite a bit of, quite a bit. Uh, so this is a, this is going to be a real problem. I think generative AI is going to have massive impacts on all industries, including ours, um, and uh, we'll see how it plays out. Um, it's you know great great couple points there. One of them is it's um, you know. If the, the adversaries use all the same technologies, to, to your point, Andrew, that um, that we use to defend organizations and make them better in every other way, in, in uh, you know just you know for uh, you know commercial reasons, There's, they have no um, they have no rules of the road. They abide by no laws, and it's basically almost frictionless compared to the, all the constraints that we that we work under. So, if you take that uh, context, uh, you know LLMs will be uh, in, incorporated into uh, threat actors. Um, Tradecraft, and uh, this is basically the the techniques, a combination of malware and other uh, uh, tech, techniques and tactics that they use to uh, make their way into your network. There's a term they call the cyber kill chain, and the kill chain is basically the think of it as a bunch of sequential steps that the adversaries have to go through to achieve their objectives. And and when you read about hacks, it sounds like there was you know they went in, did their thing, and left. And it doesn't work that way. It tends to go over a number of uh, hours or days, uh, more more typically. So there's there's usually no less than ten for them to get in. So there'll there'll be an initial way they get in. It's usually a, a human invites them in inadvertently by going to a website or opening a document that has the malware in it, and then um, and then it drops a payload. It's doing some reconnaissance. It's uh, then sending what it's discovered back to the evil layer we call the command and control channel. And then um, and then decisions are made by the human actors. And um, and then they send more payload down, say they're running Symantec or McAfee, they send in the thing to get by that. Um, they get by that and they wanna move laterally, escalate purchases. You kind of get the idea there's a lot of steps and there's a lot of back and forth. So all of those are repetitive human tasks. And the things that I think the industry, everyone in LLMs and generative AI would agree that it's, today a, a great solution for repetitive human tasks. So what we will see is those 10 steps. Every one of those steps, by the way, is a detection opportunity for firms like ours. And, and we we try to get them early on and they don't we don't want to get them late in the in the game because if you miss the last one, then it's you know it's a headline. So so you, you have opportunities in there to uh, to uh, to do detection and containment. And and this and we would we would see about fifty percent of uh, adversaries achieve objectives within uh, forty eight hours. Um, that time frame is is compressed since maybe twenty ten. It was eight weeks. Just to give you an idea, it's compressed down to just a, a few. And we've seen we've seen them complete objectives in twelve hours. So when they when they drop the LLM in there to compress eight steps into basically one. All of a sudden, we have far greater risk in that we, you know, can we as defenders uh, be able to keep up with with the LLM? So we have to we have to bring the same technology to the fight. So it's going to basically be bot wars, and that's and so we're we're actively working on this right now. So that's one context. Another one, uh, which you may have heard a term called living off the land, which is where the adversaries get in, they don't even drop malware, they just use PowerShell and some other stuff that they can find in your network environment is in fact an LLM called Copilot. And um, Copilot's available for network administrators. There's a Copilot for some of the, this is Microsoft's term, but there's other versions of it. And they can uh, they can affect great change very quickly using LLMs that are part of how we run our networks now. So that's that's you know on the horizon. I don't know if you heard it here first, but that's uh, we see that as a very existential threat uh, um, and building traps for that. And then uh, there's another area where um, Firms are, are using LLMs to achieve business advantage, so they're they're you know reducing repetitive human tasks. You've heard of you know 100 to one reductions in in, in cases uh, like you know say payment uh, authorization and uh, approvals in a regular workflow. So um, gaming those um, those LLMs internally is is another risk that's that's coming up. So so we see we see it in multiple different ways, and we're we're building. Think of them as tactical uh, micro defenses using LLMs against LLMs, and and I think that's going to be the near term future. It may get bigger and more hairy as these get smarter and quantum computing makes them go faster. Another mole, another yeah. Whack. Yep, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to ask a question. Maybe it won't be addressed today, but so you've been, everybody's mentioned about repetitive human tasks being eliminated. What does that mean for us who are skilling and reskilling and upskilling individuals where do we put where do you need us to put our attention 
because of generative AI? That's a very good question. Uh, I think that there's always going to be a need for critical thinkers forever. Like that's that's always going to be a need. So I think you know universities have always, and you know I was in the engineering department at the university that I went to, it's the University of Guelph. Um, you know they don't teach you necessarily how to do something specific out in the workforce. They teach you how to think. And I think in our industry, that's going to be critically important. You know, we talk about the whack-a-mole game. We talk about how there's now large language models. How does that change the game? We need people in our industry that can understand those concepts um, and they can apply their knowledge to create new technologies, new tools, new processes, new solutions, uh, as opposed to focusing on the repetitive tasks. So I think you're absolutely right. Generative AI, I think today, is very good at certain tasks. And there's lots of tasks that I think can be automated by a generative AI. Eventually, it, it'll be much better at processes, which is a collection of tasks. Um, and that's where it's headed. And when it goes there, I think that the workforce of the future really needs to be focused on that critical thinking aspect, problem solving, um, and not necessarily um, you know, repeating what they've been told and, and, and memorizing certain steps within a process. Um, you know, being able to come up with those steps on their own. Uh, is, is, is going to be really important. In a crude analogy, it would be, if you go back to when they invented the automobile, you almost had to be a mechanic to get it to run. And really all you need to do is get from A to B. And, um, and then you can think about what the, the mission is. And, and it's very similar to that. You don't have to know how to, you know, know how an engine works to drive nowadays. And, um, and, and to, to answer your question, um, we get them thinking on much bigger problems instead of something that's very, um, it's, it's, it's not, um, value add. It's not, not strategic. It's very tactical. So, so I think that's where it goes strategic thinking. So with, with, with only five minutes left, I got the, the hand up a few minutes ago. Um, if I can go down the line and, and start with Anthony in kind of one minute or less, uh, final thoughts. What, what would you say in terms of this topic discussion and, and uh, your ask, I guess, for the, uh, for the audience or those attending remotely? Well, I think um, this is what we spoke about at the beginning. If you are an industry player, and you are looking for innovation and you're looking for solutions to problems, I would say at least bring some of that to us in academia because we are like dry sponges there waiting for these problems. And we really want to help solve some of them. And I know we're doing a quick turnaround with problems and solutions, but uh, I think that that's the name of the game for academia and that's where we can help the most. And I really appreciate having these big players here give me a new insight into how to look at these problems because my view is a little bit constrained. So thank you so much, guys. The SpongeBob of cyber. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't resist. Um, I would say, uh, you know, we've worked with lots of folks from the various agencies uh, over the years. And one of the things that sticks with me is, and this kind of is a, a perspective, um, if you can think of it, um, they're probably already doing it or planning to. And um, so the creativity of the adversary, while they are morally corrupt, are, is to never be underestimated. And we as a society have to take this far more seriously. I worry about um, supply chains like food uh, security. Um, and we've had a couple of very high profile customers that came to us because they had a, a, a disruption in their chain and they literally had products rotting after a couple of days. And if you think of somebody doing that intentionally and given some of the geopolitical stuff going on, that's what, that's what keeps me up at night. So we need to rally the troops, which is all the corporate leaders in our country and south of the border, although they seem to be more awake to this and, and uh, start taking action. That's actually a really interesting point. Why are they ahead of us, the South? But well, that's another topic. Uh, I'd like to invite anybody who is thinking about a career in cyber to um, look for your why and really think about the security aspect, the security of our nation, the security of our supply chains, of our food, of our critical infrastructure, how we keep our lights on, where we get our water. Uh, how our children get educated, our thoughts that come to us, are they really ours? If these are the things that you think about, then you're ready for a career in cybersecurity. And for industry, uh, I'm going to put an open call. We're going to be hosting many roundtables and advisories, and uh, we need your input. We need to know what's coming. We need to know what your pain points are, what you're seeing, and be our eyes, and help us to be... Uh, 
you know, keep our feet on the ground, but looking forward as well. So join us. I'll close with this. I, uh, <clears throat> I was on holidays a couple weeks ago in, in Florida, and we decided to do a tour of NASA. It was my second time going. Um, and I love it there. And, you know, when you think about that program and what it was and what it is, it's about solving the impossible problems. And, you know, impossible is not even a word in their vocabulary. I think cybersecurity, that industry, uh, is certainly on that frontier. You know, it's a new industry. There's lots of challenges that we have in front of us. There's lots of challenges that we're not even aware of that we're going to have. Uh, and if you're interested in getting into a field that is dynamic, that requires, you know, that critical thinking that we were just talking about, problem solving, you know, very complex problems, uh, this is a field that you should look, look at very seriously. Um, so that would be my, my closing thoughts for anyone that's considering a career in cyber. And I'll just wrap up with kind of, I think, fundamentally framing the the problem. And you, we talk about critical infrastructure. We talk about all those things that that we need to have in our in our lives um, to function. And all of those things have their own singular for a focus. Uh, hospitals are in charge of taking care of people. Food distribution is, and and, and farmers are in charge of growing it. And yet, and and the threat actors are in charge of, or, or their only job, their singular focus is security breaches. And yet all those other organizations have to have security as part of them. The, 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 and in fact, the threat actors are leveraging all those other things as well. They get food, they probably go to hospitals, they do all those things, but it's not part of their business. Whereas security has to be a part of everyone's business. And organizations like JPs and ours are singular focused on cybersecurity, um, but that's fundamentally the problem: is is they have one myopic purpose. So, thank you everyone on the panel today, and uh, thank you Tech Nation for giving us the opportunity to to come up here and, and share with you. I, I actually um, we're just about to move into a break for about fifteen minutes till quarter two. I just think it would be a shame if we didn't let at least one uh, audience question. So, if anyone needs to excuse herself, you're certainly welcome to. But if anyone would like to pose a question to this panel, I can come over. Hi, thank you. This was super interesting. So I work with Empower Canada, which I think is in a similar space to Catalyst. And we're just starting to sort of upskill people. We work very much with underserved communities. Um, in Quebec, we do a great deal of work with new arrivals. What we're seeing as a potential challenge is we have a lot of really talented, really skilled people, um, and we're hearing from the cyber community that they need these people, but because there's new or perhaps they're new arrivals, that question of who you let into the world of cyber, we're seeing a bit of a wall. Can you give advice or comment on what we can do to help some of these really talented people from underserved communities or new arrivals to Canada to help break in and, and support you guys? Do you want to go first, Romy? I, I can give uh, one perspective. Um, we, um, we have uh, many of our customers uh, require that we do uh, uh, background checks on people. And, um, and you have to do uh, criminal and credit background checks. That's a problem for uh, um, new, newcomers to the country. So it depends where they come from, whether you can get any reasonable background check. But that's actually in our contracts, or, or like it's, it's part of the relationship, particularly in finance. Um, in Europe, it's um, uh, in many jurisdictions illegal. Um, and so the higher the privacy regime, which Canada has a very high privacy regime, um, it's, uh, we will see that disappear uh, as something that we can do. So um, we know that's, that's where the puck is going in, um, in privacy, and uh, we operate in the high privacy regimes of Europe and Canada. So what you have to do is then it's incumbent on us to, whoever is accessing client systems, we have to have sort of extreme monitoring of them. And then and use LLMs and other anomaly detections to to be able to make the assertions to our customers that that there's and and this is all a big data problem. You just basically see the normal pattern, and then the normal pattern once it's deviated, it sends alarms and somebody investigates. That's that's what you have to do in in the practical uh, uh, sense. And yeah, I was going to say something similar, and then um, one other thing. Um, you know, some our hands are tied. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, as JP was saying, you know, we have contracts that require us to have those background checks they have to clear. Um, and sometimes that's difficult to do when they're not a Canadian citizen. And then we actually have some contracts where we have to have Canadian citizens only um, involved in those clients. And so that makes it even harder. Um, so I, 
there's no real answer to that problem other than they're probably going to have to pass certain reliability clearance background checks and possibly get citizenship in some cases. Okay, thanks. Do you see that potentially changing or loosening or us having perhaps a sped up version as you're seeing a bigger demand for labor and the Canadian workforce is going to become more and more probably new arrivals or underserved communities that don't have those traditional trackable histories? I could see the government making it easier to get or quicker or more rapid to get those clearances, um, but I don't see that requirement going away. You know, the, the types of data and the type of um, information that we're looking at and have access to is extremely sensitive, especially when you're talking about responders. Um, you know, they're often touching the crown jewels of an organization, and those organizations, you know, you're talking about your money, right, in the financial services institutions. Or you're talking about, you know, clean water, um, drinking water. You're talking about national security uh, risks. So no, I don't. I personally don't see those requirements being removed, but possibly having more rapid. I know, especially since COVID. I don't know if it's been the same for you, JP, but getting those reliability clearance um, checks passed and secret clearance passed is it has taken longer. Um, so I, I see that potentially being a solution. One of the other challenges is uh, we operate in eighty countries. And you have privacy legislation in different countries that are conflicting with being a global operation. It's the same problem that cloud providers have. So, um, so there's uh, there's certain segments. Uh, Andrew alluded to like you work for the Canadian government. You need uh, Canadian controlled goods uh, uh, as one example, or uh, in the U.S. CMMC, ITAR. There's all and and you know some of them require to have U.S. eyes on U.S. soil. Some of them are in a room with no windows called a skiff. And and there's all versions of that. So it depends partly on where the companies are operating. Um, and how much latitude you have on, on these. I, I would just recommend, you know, some of the those hurdles for our new Canadians uh, to maybe pivot them towards the smaller enterprises, the smaller businesses, because uh, they're starving for talent and, and knowledge. And it gives them time in the country to build up their expertise, their experiences, to receive their permanent residency, towards their citizenship so one day they can be able to work for the for the larger companies which are highly regulated because the SMEs are getting hammered. Our small businesses in Canada are just, they, they don't have the resources and the abilities. So I think pivoting the attention away from high regulatory industries and because everybody wants to work for a bank, the security of a bank, the mentality of that, but to shift that, um, perception of employment. Great and we have time for just one more here. Uh, my question is aimed at Rashmi. I got very inspired by all your comments, but not to work in cyber. I'm uh, mainly interested in your feedback loop concept. So uh, have you thought more about this? Uh, have you set up a, an advisory committee with industry? Yes, uh, we do have an advisory board that I have established. And this advisory board, we give as much as we get back from them. So we talk about um, topics that are just not technical. We want to be able to look at uh, the entire talent management pipeline uh, for industry and re talking about everything from how do you create an employee employment brand for cybersecurity? What is it that you do to attract? And so we give them ideas and we receive information back. We even talk about pay and retention in cyber. And because all of that matters, and then we talk about training, training programs within companies. What is the gaps that companies are training for? Can we take some of that burden on? And then how do we, so that feedback loop is constant. And we do ask them about what are the top five things that you're looking at? One of the things that we've learned from some of our uh, fin finance clients, um, our large bank is regulatory and the regulatory issues of having individuals who are coming on board that have the accreditation. So we go and we strive to match those accreditations into our program so individuals can serve those communities. So this feedback loop is very active and we implement very quickly. So it's one thing to receive the input, but it's the action and the speed to action in an industry that's constantly changing. So if you're gonna set up an advisory committee and you're looking for this feedback loop, you have to demonstrate that you're taking it seriously and implementing it. Thank you very much. 
Excellent. Thank you very much. A round of applause, please. Thank you so much. Appreciate you making the trip. Perfect. I'll just get the next uh, group of speakers to the side of the stage and we'll resume in five minutes.
Uh, no, I'll call everyone up. You'll just want to be where. Uh, All right, welcome back from the break, everyone. As we delve into the intricacies of workforce dynamics, let's turn our attention to the fascinating intersection of human resources and cutting edge technology. Picture this, using artificial intelligence to future-proof workforce wellness. Did you know that AI-driven analytics can provide deep insights into employee wellness and well-being, and it, thereby enabling HR teams to tailor wellness programs with pinpoint accuracy? It's like having data -driven, a data-driven crystal ball to anticipate the, and address potential challenges before they arise. So fellow HR geeks, buckle up for our next panel discussion on the latest innovations in AI shaping our future workforce wellness. Please welcome to the stage, Elizabeth Keller, Camille Labat, Daniel Bordenave, Danina Kapeda-Novic, and welcome back to Vula Vasilopoulos. This is gonna be a good one. <laughs> check, check, check. How are we feeling? Awesome. Yeah. Great. Those lights are really bright. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're blinding. We needed yeah. our sunglasses. Well, good morning and thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we have a fascinating topic up for discussion using AI to future proof work workplace wellness and how it can be leveraged to positively influence the workplace. So today we're going to hear from our panel members on their views on how AI uh, can be leveraged to future-proof wellness in the workplace while provoking us in new ways of interpreting AI against our own current ways of thinking and or perceptions. So quickly, what is artificial intelligence? Simply, artificial intelligence, or AI, is technology that enables computers and machines to stimulate human intelligence and problem-solving capabilities. So throughout this session, our panel experts will discuss AI and how it has the potential to transform several aspects of employee well-being and how the field of mental health presents a, uniquely op or a unique opportunity for AI to make a significant impact. So before we begin, I'm going to introduce myself really briefly. I'm Vula, Vula with, that's Hula with a V, Director of Talent Acquisition for Intrac. Um, and as much as I believe in a human-centric approach, AI definitely benefits myself, my team, and I enable my leadership, uh, my leadership team to use AI in any way, shape, shape or form to enhance their personal and professional well-being. There's a shortcut way to do it through AI, let's do it, and let's get some fun in, in the work again. So please join me this morning. Um, I'd like to introduce you um, to Danina. Hello. Over to you for a brief intro. So Danina Kapitanovich, um, I'm a healthcare professional by training, speech language pathologist who has turned uh, into a chief innovation officer um, over a, 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 a tumultuous career of about 30 years, uh, you know, initiated in healthcare, moved through the world of international development, and then uh, you uh, finally ending up in my current role, which is the chief innovation officer for um, integrated uh, university health and social services network for West Central Montreal, where I have founded and currently run our Connected Health Innovation Hub, OROT, which has a mandate to uh, reinforce, instigate and reinforce uh, already a very strong culture of innovation present in our institution, um, inform, train, uh, prepare, inspire the, the future generation of innovators, um, as well as create a bridge between uh, private and public sector in order to drive the creation of the next generation of digital health products. And you speak five languages. I do. I do indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very happy to be here with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next, we have Elizabeth Keller. Thanks, Vula and team. And uh, so happy to be here. And um, Montreal is my hometown. So first of all, that makes it even more, more of a great uh, trip for me uh, to be back here and talking with these amazing panelists and to the audience for being here. 
Um, my name is Elizabeth Keller again. I'm with Amazon Web Services. So yes, Amazon and Amazon Web Services. And we actually work nationally with all of our healthcare ministries, um, as well as hospitals and uh, physicians to actually implement new technologies to advance patient care. So I'm thrilled to be here. I also work um, on behalf of ISO globally, and I represent Canada for all of our digital health standards to make sure we can exchange all of this information uh, around the world. So uh, lots to talk about today on AI, and uh, I come from the government side, so I understand healthcare care delivery. I've worked with uh, 40,000 doctors in Ontario to implement all the virtual care through COVID. Uh, so I very much understand uh, the tough uh, nature of healthcare delivery on the ground, and that's really important and, and how innovation is gonna actually help that. Thank you. Camille, over to you. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone, my name is Camille. Thank you to Tech Nation for having us today. Thank you for the panel to be here as well. Um, so I'm responsible for the delivery center of Cinecon, an IT consulting firm, um, and we special, specialize in digital transformation in the, for the financial services. Um, our team has uh, recently released, a, um, we call it a Nexus AI suite of Gen AI products for our, uh, for our clients. Um, and I'm responsible for um, 80 plus people in Montreal. So we have to scale, retain our talent and make sure that we're upskilling them to be able to work with Gen AI in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Dan, over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for Tech Nation for allowing me to come here and talk about this uh, this scary term called AI. Uh, my name is Dan Bordenave. I um, I was a kinesiologist in the healthcare field for a long time, uh, which led me to invent a medical device that's currently currently being used in long term care hospitals and retirement homes. Uh, while I was doing that, I started mentoring other entrepreneurs uh, how to you know really get their business off the ground which afforded me the role of the CEO of the Niagara Falls Innovation Hub too, uh, which is a large facility in, in Niagara Falls, Canada, and we help to specialize in bringing companies uh, from idea to commercialization across many different sectors, but mostly focused on healthcare, agriculture, tourism, and manufacturing technologies. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, let's get started. Uh, Elizabeth, my first question is for you. What are some groundbreaking innovations in digital healthcare in recent times? How can organizations and its leaders leverage generative AI insights, digital tools for its workforce to thrive and inform broader organizational strategies, such as talent management, workforce planning, and well being? Awesome. Well, that's a two part question. It so is. I will, um, but I, I'm happy to answer it because uh, all of us do find technology a lot of fun but I want to talk about um, three particular examples in terms of some of the cool stuff happening, innovative stuff happening in healthcare that I thought you'd be interested in mostly um, today. So the top three that come to mind for me, and this really builds around workforce management because doctors, nurses, clinicians are very, very burnt out. Um, the administrative burden on clinicians, clinicians is real. The burnout is real. So learning how to actually use ambient listening and ambient scribing so that clinicians can actually do patient care instead of having to be typing at their computers when you go to visit them in their office is now real. So a lot of um, in Canada, you're going to start seeing a, a huge use of ambient listening and ambient scribing, which saves what we call pajama time for clinicians and having to put that all of those records in your chart later on at night. So this is going to revolutionize the way clinicians actually deliver care. It's also going to provide them with advanced decision tooling. So when we talk about AI and Gen AI, being able to actually write at the clinician's fingertips um, have AI actually look at the summary of the patient and recommend perhaps things that might have been missed or recommend a treatment protocol that just came out or was released in the latest publications that maybe that clinician didn't know about. So that's really exciting. So ambient listening and ambient scribing is one that's really cool. Um, another one that I'm thinking about is uh, actually right here, the Allen in, uh, in Montreal is actually mapping the brain um, for the first time on AWS so that you can actually then anticipate some of the diseases and start to use Gen, I, Gen AI to apply to those brain specific diseases. So that's incredibly exciting work taking place right here in your backyard. Another example um, that I thought you'd find interesting, I'm working with a surgeon right now uh, at UHN in Toronto. And what he's actually doing is he's videotaping his surgeries 
and then using an AI, developing an AI algorithm, annotating on those surgeries and providing notes, and then uploading them so that um, it, people can be trained around the world on those surgeries. Using an AI algorithm to anticipate those types of surgeries in other countries with other surgeries, so, uh, surgeons. So this is pretty, pretty amazing from a training and capacity perspective. Training is a huge, huge thing. So when you ask me the second part of the question, which is what are the main themes in terms of how we're actually going to manage the workforce and healthcare moving forward, three main things come to mind. The first one's training. So training's in, incredibly important for all of us to build this capacity around AI. Um, for Amazon especially, we train worldwide and, and offer courses on Gen AI for free, um, available in 14 languages so that healthcare workers and your teams can actually build their own skills. And this is really, really important as we start to move forward. We all have to learn more, not at every level, to actually understand the implications of AI, but also to develop the skills and become practitioners ourselves. Um, this is where it's all going. Number two, so retaining that talent. So how do you actually keep your workers happy? How do you know if they're happy? A lot of places do a once a year survey. That's what you get as an employee and then they don't talk to you for another year. Um, so now what we're actually doing, working with a lot of healthcare organizations, including Alia Care, which again is in your backyard. It's a home care agency here. They actually match up um, the preferred shifts of the home care worker so that they're actually a happier and they get the shifts they want and they're less likely to go work for any other company. But moreover, they're doing daily checks on that employee to make sure they're actually happy with their job, they're getting what they need, et cetera. So this is actually keeping a workforce and retaining them. And the last one is deploying. So doing new ways of doing healthcare. So deployment in healthcare, you know, virtual care, and then building on that, Danine is gonna talk about remote patient care, this is a huge area for keeping patients healthy outside of hospitals and using technologies like Alexa, monitoring your vitals, um, having a nurse on call uh, as soon as you get discharged from surgery. So instead of having to sit here in the hospital, you can go home, be comfortable and be monitored. Make sure that you're actually your drug adherence is working because usually within the 20, first 24 hours is the challenge that most people have. So right away, we're, we're checking all of that and you get much better service as a patient and you're much more comfortable. So those are our three main areas, but um, I hope that answered your question. That was incredible. I, you know, as I heard you speak even from the other day on this topic and this morning and this conversation today, AI can sound very intimidating to so many of us, but you've simplified it in a way that it makes sense and like we're ready for it. You know, like where, 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 where has it been all this time? So thank you so much for that. Thank you. All right, Danina, over to you. Mm -hmm. We're excited to, to keep moving forward and learning more. Despite initial skepticism about AI's role in health-related purposes, in what ways has AI helped improve mental health in the workplace? So it's a very uh, interesting question that sort of uh, uh, brings us um, at the crux of, of um, uh, a lot of the issues that, that Elizabeth has covered in terms of um, readiness and, and development of the right kind of technology that uh, really uh, taps into the, uh, uh, the the needs behind them and that really takes into consideration the the user and kind of sits at that crux of of, of benefits versus versus potential uh, potential adverse effects uh, so I'll, I'll start with a concrete example um, a pandemic was a challenging time for uh, for all of us, and but in particular, it has affected the, the healthcare workers, um, causing tremendous amount of burnout. Um, there was an, an exodus of a huge number of healthcare workers who, uh, you know, succumbed to pressure. The a pandemic itself also disproportionately affected healthcare professionals, and so it became very important to. Um, uh, create uh, a right kind of conditions to maintain the, the, the mental health of, of healthcare professionals. Um, one way in which we did that is um, to uh, understand, sort of create heat maps of, of, of stress. Um, and so we've uh, worked with a company in, um, in terms of co-developing uh, and then uh, consequently deploying a solution that has allowed us to um, really get a very good sense of uh, where the high areas of stress are, 
um, all the while ensuring confidentiality and 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 sort of confidence building uh, um, uh, with with our staff, whereby they were able to sort of indicate what is their uh, emotional state, and therefore, from the perspective of the management, allow us to intervene without singling out sort of uh, uh, a particular particular employee. So. Um, to that end, uh, artificial intelligence really has a huge role to play because uh, not only does it allow uh, for the you know absorption of large amount of data, but it uh, and, and and interpretation of that data in real time, but also it gives you a capacity over time to predict um, and and therefore act preempt preemptively and proactively in in making sure that. Um, you get ahead of the issues, you get a good sense of where the issues are, and you get ahead of uh, the issues and, and, and put measures in place to, um, to ensure that the mental health uh, uh, issues do not cause um, the, the kind of exodus, right. for example, that we have seen, we have seen during the pandemic. How mm -hmm. could we, how, what would you, from your experience, what would you say is the next step um, to embed AI to further enhance the well-being so again as i said it's i think it it, it comes down to and, and i know Camille is going to touch upon that uh, it, it it comes down to you know really understanding fully uh the benefits and but also the potential sort of uh negative effects of of artificial intelligence so it it, it absolutely has the capacity to make the mundane uh, um, go away to simplify tasks to to make the person sort of focus on uh, uh, you know what is particularly important if you speak from the perspective of the healthcare so spending more time with the patient focusing sort of um, on our craft and and therefore making the tasks uh, more interesting, people more more sort of involved, the upside. The downside, as we have discussed this morning, mm -hmm. is that in order to get to a certain <laughs> level of craft, you there's a there's uh, it's a, it's a sort of an exponential growth process where you have to start as a beginner and then you know spend a certain uh, uh, amount of time. Right. And so uh, making sure that we uh, you know putting people Putting people, uh, getting people to really understand the crux of the technology, uh, making sure that they have the right skills so that that uh, technology can be developed in a way that it it sort of you 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 mitigate the measures that can ultimately negatively impact them is to me the way of the future. So what does that translate into concretely? So not only uh, an engaged workforce that understands the basic concepts of AI, but an engaged workforce uh, when it comes to uh, technology development. So taking sort of a center stage in and, and contributing to development of the technology so as to make sure that it really truly addresses the needs and therefore uh, avoids sort of the pitfalls of, uh, of a workforce that is disengaged and that doesn't understand and that kind of can't get ahead of, of where the technology is taking us. Thank mm -hmm. you so much mm -hmm. for that. Anyone have anything to add to that? No. I think you covered it all, but it was, um, it's, it's very inspiring to you to know what we can, we can potent potentially do to um, also provide uh, better access to healthcare as well and making sure that the people who are working in those those fields are taken care of so they can take good care of us as well um, and it's exciting to see that we already have solutions that are helping us towards this thank you Dan yes over to you Perfect. I'm really looking forward to hearing your perspectives on this theme AI means pervasive change what strategies can organizations and leaders implement to promote a thriving work culture make the workforce feel safe or to combat that worry that AI will dehumanize the workplace? Yeah, um, I just want to say, first of all, that, you know, AI, it seems like it's a relatively new thing, but it's been around for a number of years. I mean, your social media algorithms are all AI. So if you like sports, you're going to find sports. Or for me, this past weekend, I was searching poutine, and now my social media is full of poutine posts, too. But <laughs> the, the, the fact is that it's always been around. It's just that for the first time, it's accessible to everybody. And what that does, it puts a fear in people to say, Oh my God, my job's going to be replaced. But it's up to the employee to make sure that they're upskilling and reskilling themselves and the employer to provide those opportunities. You know, a doctor who doesn't stay up to date with the latest literature is not a good doctor, right? So 
uh, we have to start thinking about that as saying, how can we provide opportunities for all our employees to have that training, to have policies around uh, using AI. You know, when the internet first came out, everybody was worried that the internet was going to replace jobs. And then social media came out and people thought that I was going to replace marketing jobs and stuff like that too. But it's up to the employer and employee to provide opportunities for upskilling uh, and reskilling so that they always stay up to date with, uh, with the newest technologies. Now, the dehumanizing of the workplace, I actually think that the AI is helping to rehumanize the workplace. And COVID, if there's one good thing about COVID is we, uh, during the pandemic, because we realized that there, there needs to be more to a work-life balance. Before, before the pandemic, we were all running on a very high octane, working you know, around the clock, working all hours of the night. And then when we were stuck to work from home, we started to realize that, hey, you know what, I can be more performance-based as a more time-based. I can do more in less time. And I think that AI is a perfect tool to do that. I know that I can write a proposal a lot quicker now by pulling in bullet, bullet points and then using open AI to fill in the blanks. During the pandemic, again, we started communicating in email in very short form forms, you know, one word answers, quick, quick responses, using more chats like Teams and stuff like that too, to be more efficient in the workplace. And I think that having an AI tool allows us to be more efficient in the workplace, allows us to do a lot of the tedious, uh, mundane tasks that we don't want to do. It allows it to fill. So it's, it's almost like having your own personal assistant always working with you. And uh, in a world where, you know, a lot of organizations are, are, don't have enough funds to give their employees raises all the time right. by allowing them to have a better work-life balance, allow them to have tools so that they feel more comfortable in the workplace and that they can actually, you know, do more in less time by using these tools will actually create a more thriving work culture. So I think the dehumanizing, I think that's just, you know, uh, more of a myth. I think it's actually going to provide us with more opportunity for more interactions between us because right. we're using the AI to substitute those mundane and tedious tasks. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> and if I may jump no, that, on that this. That was incredible. I was gonna, I, if you don't mind, if, sure. I, if I may add, you know, working in HR and you think of the use of technology and, and recruitment, how do you, I've often been asked, how do you humanize your process with the use of so much AI? And our, like my, our organization uses AI to really leverage a human centric approach to all of our people interactions. So if I use the short version or the short listing or, allow the algorithms to produce outcomes for me, I can actually enjoy an eyeball to eyeball conversation exactly. with people. So I really value all that you shared right now. Anyone else want to chime in? Yeah, I just want to jump on something that you said. It's not only AI is a, is a time savior, but it, it requires us to review also the results of AI because mm -hmm. again, um, AI doesn't think like we do. Um, and so it's not always, the accuracy is not always there. So it's important for everyone to review the work that has been through or is coming from a Gen AI. And that the previous panel was talking about, was talking about critical thinking. So it gives us also the opportunity to invest more in critically think, which is what makes us human and stand out and connect better on uh, more strategic levels probably. So I think that would be a benefit as well. I, thanks. Um, go. I'm just going to say there are some caveats, however, uh, and I, I don't mean to be the naysayer of the group, <laughs> um, but um, there's AI is only as good as the algorithm that you create and the data that you use to feed it. And so I, I'm going to let you, okay. from your expertise, speak about exactly. the data piece, but in terms of the algorithm creation, the role of the human, and, and, and again, going back to my earlier point, the importance of an engaged workforce, not just from the perspective of understanding what it is, but actually being involved in the development thereof. Um, during COVID, there was an explosion of, of AI algorithms that promised to sort out all sorts of issue and very few delivered on the, on the promise. And one of the very early uh, studies uh, that looked at uh, the behavior of AI, the effectiveness of, 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 of AI, found that what worked really well in the lab ended up not working very well in the real life environment. And underlying the fact that doesn't mean that the technology doesn't have problems you know, the promise to, that it can deliver upon, but it has to be created a certain way. It has to be very context sensitive. It has to have good quality of data and, and it has to have engagement of those uh, who, you know, deliver a service, uh, understand it profoundly and all of these sort of um, uh, aspects then create algorithms that can be truly functional and, and, and truly used. But without that, 
there's pitfalls and there's dangers as well. Um, so, yeah, over and I, I love that. And, and absolutely, we call it um, the democratization of data and the democratization of AI, a very important concept that you don't leave big swaths of humanity behind in this journey. Um, you really need to educate. You really need to bring people along so that they understand their role and how it could actually, you can develop skills at all ages, at all types, at all times in your life with the new digital um, tools available in terms of, of augmented reality, virtual reality. We're now using training methodologies around the world and again, offered for free for all workforces. And by the way, skills centers we just built in South Africa, in, in Brazil, in Washington, and in other places where maybe they won't have access to those skills. You can walk in off the street and literally learn how to do coding or building or working with AI or learning about these new technologies all for free. All with the idea that we used to have a problem about data that we didn't have enough. We're almost now tilting the other way where we have so much data that it's pretty much impossible for a human to do this on their own. So now AI can be applied to all of this data and in healthcare for us, clinically, it's really important. There's a lot of data repositories the provincial ministries have put in place where frankly a physician doesn't have time to go through all that data for every patient and could possibly make an error. So now what we're doing is applying summarization and AI tools so that it actually provides the relevant information for the clinician so they can quickly understand what's going on and treat the patient, not worrying that they've missed something. So these are really important ideas around democracy, around how we get people involved, around training, because you're right, it is it, there is a, a big new world ahead of us and we're just getting started. Thank you. I hope you're all soaking this in. <laughs> Camille, how can organizations measure the success of AI-driven wellness programs? And what key performance indicators, also known as KPIs, are relevant in assessing the impact on both individual and organizational levels? Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so I think AI and well-being are two very hot topics. So, um, and there are on everyone's mind, and I'm sure a lot of executives have been thinking about what KPIs to use. Um, but to go back to AI, I think at the end of the day, it's a tool, so we shouldn't necessarily reinvent completely the wheel. Obviously, it brings a lot to the table that I will talk about later. But when we're talking about well-being, I think um, we can keep our traditional metrics in the first place. So first, assess at the organization level, how are we doing? Um, is the workforce satisfied? Is, are they truly happy? And so here you're looking at attrition, turnover, DEI, demographics, trying to also cross-reference this KPIs together, are people of color leaving your workforce more than others? Why? Um, the amount of burnout or long leaves that you have. All of, all of these are very important. Then I would go to a second le uh, level of uh, KPIs, which is more at the program level. Well-being is very, very large. We're talking about financial stability. We're talking about mental health, uh, work-life balance, uh, benefits. Um, it's again very broad. So having one program that one program cannot tackle all of it, um, and um, so evaluating whether the scope is correct, that would be my second level. I think the second layers of KPIs I'd be looking at: how many people are using the program intended, and then only finally I would look at the AI because the AI does bring. Um, so if the the program is backed up by an AI, I would be looking. Um, at KPIs that allow to mitigate the risk that we just talked about before, because it does bring a lot of um, constraints and limitations. Uh, we've all heard about hallucinations. Um, then, you know, you were saying about the algorithm reflects who's built it. We are flawed humans, so we have a lot of biases. Um, so we need to make sure that the algorithm are not reproducing the systematic, systematic issues that we have in our uh, society. Um, so the accuracy level is important, the latency, um, and then again, Gen AI brings a whole other conversation about computing cost. So not all organization probably can go ahead with having a lot of LLMs implemented. Um, it also costs a lot in terms of energy. So if you have an ESG or a carbon policy, maybe evaluating those as well would be important. 
Um, so I think those three levels of KPIs will probably help make sure that the AI program, well-being program uh, developed is effective. Um, and it has a huge potential for to enhance the workforce well-being um, by providing, I think, uh, a lot of enhanced and specialized customization. Each worker is different, they have different needs, um, by being also probably faster in implementation. Um, and anywhere where you have a lot of data and not a lot of resources, usually AI is a good access. So for us, we've been using it a lot in our HR functions, making sure that employees can basically have a first level um, basically, it's a Gen AI that is first answering their questions and um, and just, yeah, policy, uh, concerns about policy, and then only it's escalated to a, to a human if, if the Gen AI can't answer it fully. Um, and if all of this is aligned, then I think we'll have like full functioning uh, well-being programs that needs to be done, I think, carefully, ethically, and with a focus on education, transparency, and communication. Thank you. Do you have any learnings or takeaways? Um, Look at the data that you input in your algorithm. Um, and we work with financial services, so uh, a huge focus on security is always important. And I would say uh, the involvement, if I may, the involvement of the user in the development of the AI. I keep coming back to that, but it's, it's, it's such a crucial component. Don't forget the human behind the technology. Right. Implicate the human in the development of the, of the technology. Thank you. So I have a question I'd like to, oh, go ahead, Elizabeth. I just, um, it made me think, you made an excellent point on the impact of, um, on our, our planet from a sustainability perspective. So we know AI has a massive impact, all of technology does, all of us using our phones every day. This is taking a lot of water, a lot of power. <laughs> um, sustainability is a huge new trend in terms of healthcare and where and how power is being used. Just a little stat for you. Um, Five, every five questions you put into a large language model query, I'm not going to name the product you're using. Mm -hmm. um, it could be at any any company. It takes a half a liter of water. So just think about that. So with every person on the planet and and lots of researchers who are doing even more super compute needs, we have got to be really cognizant of how we're building sustainability into our healthcare. Again, not just AI, but our application of healthcare generally and how we can help the planet. It's a new trend and we're actually measuring that at AWS now and helping our customers actually. So from a KPI perspective, 100% measurable. I'd love to talk to you more about that. I think Elon Musk said yesterday by next year, we're gonna run out of transformers as a direct result of, of abuse of AI. So it's a crucial component and not just in healthcare, I would say across industries, right? Thank you. I'd like to open my next question up to the group. So what are some best practices in the road ahead? How can organizations find the right balance between innovation and humanity? For example, the use of AI to enhance performance assessments, provide psychological safety, work-life balance, motivation, and engagement to its workforce. Uh, well, I mean, I think we have to think of AI simply as a tool that we use uh, and more of a validation tool to make sure that you know, what we've done is, is being validated. Human error is, is around for, it's been around forever. And I'm thinking strictly in the healthcare, you know, uh, doctors, clinicians, healthcare practitioners, they, they have burnout. They work very, very hard to have burnout. They make errors and make mistakes. The third leading cause of death in the United States is medical error. First is, is, is cancer, then heart disease and medical error. That shouldn't happen, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're trained professionals. They spend years and years of school you would you put your faith and your trust in them so they don't make these errors but it happens we're human we make errors so i think by using ai as a tool as a validation tool it allows them to feel more comfortable in their prognosis diagnosis uh and also it makes them feel more comfortable in what they're doing is the correct way to do it um there's a company that we work out of in niagara falls it's called emerge connect and it's an ai tool that you type in your symptoms and it tells you to go to urgent care go to hospital or book an appointment right. with your doctor. Now that tool is, is, is amazing because what you're doing is you're not overloading the healthcare system. I forget the data, the stats, but there's some ridiculous number that the number of people that go to emergency is they don't actually have emergencies, but they're overloading the system. And the other day um, I was with my, my, old, my father, he, he was on a bike in February uh, cycling and he fell and broke his ribs. I had to get mad at him. Like, what are you doing cycling in February? But it was a nice day. So uh, regardless, I was sitting there and I was watching the triage nurse 
And the triage nurse was just patient after patient after patient without any break. That, that, that takes a toll on, on her uh, and, and it, in her job that she can make these errors too. So by having tools such as the scribing tool uh, and, and having this Emerge Connect tool where that you can get the triage before the patient even comes into the, the emergency room can save so much time and so much human error. So I think, you know, uh, from that perspective, I think it's a, a tool, a validation tool, a research tool that we need if a doctor can put all the notes in and then the AI can, can, can produce a list of potential issues with that patient, you know, it, it saves the time, it saves the worry, and it saves the air. If I, if I may, as the naysayer of the group again, <laughs> say there's, a, the, the, there's, there's caveats to that. Absolutely everything you, you said, and yet, here we are. Emergency rooms flooded, people exhausted, uh, technology not adopted. Um, there's a lot of resistance to of adopting technology. And so it takes a workforce that is primed, that is prepared, it takes conditions, um, it takes um, bridges between public and private, it takes keen understanding, it takes involvement, and it takes uh, really understanding what is the psychology behind the resistance. And so I can tell you from the perspective of someone who runs an innovation hub that looks to foster development of, of technologies, um, User engagement is, is a, absolutely a key com component for several reasons. One is to make sure that um, technology does no harm. Uh, second aspect is the aspect of responsibility. So yes, there are tools, but ultimately the responsibility still rests with the human. And for as long as we haven't resolved that conundrum, there will be resistance on the part of, of certainly, you know, maybe not the first adopters, but everybody else that comes behind. Um, how do I use something that makes a recommendation in my stead when ultimately responsibility rests with me? Which leads us to the third component, which is the explainability. Um, a lot of clinicians are resistant towards adoption of AI because um, they uh, feel the, what they call the black box effect. Um, how did something come up with a recommendation? Where, where, where is that recommendation coming from? All of this brings us back to the point that I have made uh, several times now, and that is the involvement of the user in, in the, and, and the process of co-creation of the technology. It is very, very important uh, not just to uh, be able to use it to know what it is, but really to proactively um, um, uh, get involved in the creation of technology. And, and the hub that I run really is a platform for that for that type of work to take uh, place. We, we, all of the technology, um, all, a lot of the technology that we bring in um, is the technology that uh, has been co-development, uh, co-developed -co and, 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 and what that means is that um, the user feedback has been built into the uh, creation of technology. I would, I would say that among them all, AI probably is where we have to insist on this notion the most if we are to really see the benefit and the adoption that we're seeking to achieve. No, and, and uh, I'm going to, yeah, to that point too, I, I completely agree the resistance to using new technology, whether it's AI, even my, my medical device is a hardware device that is so simple to understand that it was so hard to get physiotherapists and occupational therapists to jump on board because it's so stuck on the way of doing things, right? So to that point too, I think it really takes time. Right. And we're, 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 we're trying to rush the implementation of AI, but it just takes time. And the younger generations that are going to be studying in med school, they're going to already have that as part of their curriculum. So, you know, it's only be a matter of time before AI will just be part of every, every single role in the healthcare organization. And they'll be well-trained and comfortable with it because it'll be part of the curriculum that they're brought up with. It's just the, a lot of the, the clinicians right now, they're just stuck in traditional methods of doing stuff and they're scared of technology because it's going to take away time that they don't have uh, to learn that. Right. So uh, I, I completely agree. So what are we doing about embracing and getting workforces and organizations, employers? Like, what are we doing to push the bar, raise the bar, and get the naysayers on board? Because they're going to be left behind at some point. Like you mentioned, the students, it's embedded yes. in their way of working. And so how can we upskill the, the rest to, to look forward to all these elements that we've been talking about, well-being and being progressive and getting to that result a lot faster? Uh, well, back to the training, like the, the types of training that is now available, is it's truly remarkable. Using AI, where you can actually 
and and Amazon is watermarking a lot of their AI personas. But I was taking a, tra a training course the other day, which I do a lot of because I've got to keep learning at the same time too. Um, it doesn't, you know, we're we're all in this together. Um, and looking at some of the personas that are getting created to make training so much more engaging, where you actually, you're not even sure if you're talking to a real person anymore. Not only that, the training is adaptive to me. So you can actually start seeing that, take a personalized learning approach to that learner, understand where they're falling short, how you can help them in certain areas, maybe other areas they're great at, you don't have to waste as much time on it. So the little tests that come forward are actually adapting to your own right. style. The other thing is, um, I really wanna talk about the wellness question you said back, uh, one question back was uh, personalized medicine. So I can't emphasize enough taking can your cancer data and taking your genomic data and being able to have a personalized approach to your cancer will be game changing. So this is where I think the personalized approach at the worker level, the personalized approach at the healthcare level, the personalized approach at the doctor and clinician level where we're helping them. These, it's this personalization, knowing you want to eat poutine on your phone. That's one example, but <laughs> applying that to healthcare, yeah. I think is, is really interesting. And I think that's, it's that humanization of uh, an individualization factor that I think is, is important. Thank you. I made a statement the other day when we spoke and I, I, it was a statement around how a lot of people feel that AI is a threat to humanity. And you shared that example and, you know, it's so simple, right? So simple. Um, and impactful. So thank you. My final question, I think it's my final question. What are some defining trends to embrace in AI and, work and workplace wellness? And how might they impact organizational culture and employee well-being? So I'll go back to the example that I gave, and that is um, getting a sense of meeting people where they are. I think it's connected to the idea of, of personalization that you're, you're talking about. Um, meeting people where they are and understanding uh, understanding their needs and 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 sort of um, creating creating those heat maps and creating that predictive capability that allows you then to put mitigating uh, uh, measures in place before there's a deterioration of and and and, and in an environment like ours which continues to be high stress. Pand I mean, pandemic was obviously a, uh, an outlier event. Um, but it's a stressful environment and anyone would agree on any given day. And it's an environment where um, the needs far surpass um, the, uh, the the capacity to deliver. So the pressure on the people is is tremendous. And so the ability to, to uh, uh, meet people where they are, create personalized experiences, um, understand what are the challenges and address those challenges in a personalized way is where I see AI having a tremendous role. I mean, there were some great examples that were given. Elizabeth, you mentioned what Alaya Kier does, you know, with the with the shift work, you know, the ability to uh, simplify repetitive dull tasks, automatize them. Uh, I mean, all of this together, um, uh, you know, AI has a tremendous role in terms of mitigation. But before we get there, I think we have to understand where the issues are and technology can definitely help in that regard as well. Thank you. Go ahead. And I think uh, one, one theme we didn't talk about but, uh, on the panel today um, is really about how leadership is really, really important. Canadians value their health care. They like being involved in their health care. They don't mind getting their health care funded. We pay a lot for our health care in Canada and we appreciate our health care. And I think I'm really looking at the leadership in Canada. So I like the fact that Health Canada and many of the ministries are getting much more involved in these bigger decisions around AI, around where we're actually taking our healthcare from a Canadian perspective, looking at privacy and security, leadership around the world, um, building from the best so that we can actually learn from others um, and tackle this together. I can't emphasize it's real, we really need leadership at the top um, to really step in now and start taking more comprehensive approaches, not only to, to set policy, but to do like Quebec is doing, act as leaders and move forward on cloud-based mandates and on, on, on projects that are going to actually help and get measured. So um, that, that's my, uh, my kick these days is better leadership and, and glad to see people are involved. And to jump on what you're saying, I think you're touching on a very interesting point, which is um, we need every sector to be involved in collaborating together. So government, industry, 
Um, and so when we see academia, uh, so when we see like organization like Mila Ivado or any or groups like this, they're really pushing us forward in terms of in the industry specifically as well, making sure that we are um, embedding the best practices when it comes to AI. It's here to stay. And we have a tendency to overestimate the short-term impact and underestimate the long-term impact. So make sure that we are creating the space to think about what's coming next, but much, much later. Um, we didn't talk, talk too much about, uh, we did mention upscaling, but I think we're gonna see a lot of different roles and different jobs. And that is also a source of excitement, uh, at least when I'm talking to our software developers, uh, some of them are getting more excited about becoming prompt engineers and like looking at all the nitty gritty in an algorithm that I can't speak to you, but um, I think there is a, a lot of interest also for pe from people um, and that can be excited as well. Yeah, and I think it's uh, a, a lot of it too is just making people realize that this is a, a time-saving, uh, efficient tool to use. And with any organization, any sector, there's gonna be a little bit of downtime to learn that. And that's what a lot of people fear is they don't have the ability to have that downtime. But the downtime for such an exponential growth and efficiency is needed too. So I think the, one of the things is people in organizations have to start making plans, have to start making rollout plans, say, okay, within the next year, two years, we want to roll this out. So that gives people the idea, okay, this is coming, but I have time to prepare for it. Um, when you're talking about uh, the charting and the pajama, I, I was one of those people and it was the worst thing ever because you're charting at night and you forgot what a lot of stuff you did during that day too. Uh, one of the companies that out of our hub, it's called Dosery2 and what they do is they actually have tools uh, like that scope that is, is automated, uh, automatically charting as they take in your, your heart rate or your breathing. Uh, so again, it's scary because you're like, I, I don't have the down, I don't have the time to, to learn about this and about this new technology. But I think if, if people create plans, uh, people will feel more comfortable knowing that it's coming. Just like when a company has to switch operating software, if you went from Google to Amazon or for my, Google to Microsoft Teams, it sucks. It sucks for an organization. It's a lot of downtime to learn a new system, but that system makes it more efficient. And if they see the end goal, then they might be more on board to, to jump on earlier. Thank you. Well, I think I'm getting a cue that uh, our time might be up. Such an engaging topic. So thank you so much for coming together and sharing your subject matter expertise and perspective on this really impactful theme that impacts all of us, like in our day-to-day -day life and what extends outside of our day-to-day -day life, uh, prof personally or professionally. Um, does anyone here in this group have any questions? Maybe we can take one or two. Sure. Um, I have a question for uh, Elizabeth and Daniel. The World Health Organization, the International Labor Organization last year um, released a big study and it found that heart disease is the number one source of occupational death in the workplace globally. And the biggest risk factor for that is long working hours. Do you have an idea of how long the efficiency gains from generative AI will take to materialize in the healthcare space, which is one of the places where people are suffering the most from long working hours? And do you think that those efficiency gains will just get backfilled by the really, really high demand for other services in that industry? Um, Hard to hard to put a, a number to that. Obviously, it wasn't something I was prepared to answer on the spot. But the uh, I, I do feel that it's going to take um, quite a few years before it's first of all broadly broadly adopted on all these new technologies. So we're going to have a little bit of a pain period in the next little while. The federal government has invested a lot of money in terms of trying to help fill that gap, support primary care, et cetera. But you raise that important point, which is how can we make the clinician burden uh, way easier? And I know there's groups all over the world focused on that exact question. From a measurement perspective, um, I I'm gonna look into it now that you've asked it. Um, and uh, I do think that that's a really interesting finding and unfortunately not surprising. Yeah, and and um, one of the things I wanna do is, yeah, they, they may correlate it between long working hours, but what else has happened in that person's life? What are their eating habits? What are their exercise habits? That all relates to heart disease too. So I think, you know, it's easy to point at, yeah, long working hours is the reason for such a high heart disease, but it's what those long working hours, what that does to the person's lifestyle. And so I think, you know, by having these AI tools that can allow them to take breaks and, you know, 
eat healthier, exercise more, then I think we can kind of see those numbers go down. I don't, uh, I, I think it's like Elizabeth said, it's going to take time. Um, but I think, you know, if we, we have to look at the whole person, not just their occupation and say, what, what else is related to that heart? Because, you know, a lot of many people argue that heart disease is a person made disease that's related to lifestyle. So if, that, if that's a high stress job and the high stress jobs lead to poor eating habits, poor sleeping habits, poor exercise habits, yeah, then that'll all correlate to, you know, heart disease too. To others, all good. I think that's a wrap. Awesome. That's a mind, me Mel mind meets machine, everyone. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, happy International Women's Day to oh. tomorrow, everybody. March Thank 8th. You. So happy Thank International Women's Day. Thank you, Camille. Elizabeth, why not? Amina, thank you so much. Cheers. Excellent. I'll just ask, ask the folks to just be mindful of the center aisle here. We've got the live stream running. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna go into um, our our last panel for the day. And I just wanna remind everyone to uh, who's in the audience today to stick around for some of the networking opportunities. We brought in a really great group of, uh, of young, bright students who are looking to network and learn more about the tech sector and opportunities therein. And uh, hopefully you'll join us for some celebratory end of future wave beverages brought to you by Seawill uh, this afternoon. So um, as we continue our journey into the realm of cutting edge technology, uh, I want to shift our focus to the mind bending world of quantum computing, or at least uh, my, I find it mind bending anyways. Um, quantum computing isn't just the future, it's the present. Did you know that a quantum computer can comp can perform complex calculations in seconds that would take a classical computer millions of years to complete. I'll leave it to the panelists to correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but in any case, it is testament to the incredible power and potential of this transformative technology. So prepare to be awestruck as we delve deeper into the quantum realm in the next panel discussion. Please bring to the stage Sarah Blanchette, Vincent Thomasette, Marie-Ève Boulanger, Julien Chausson, and Martin Leforet. So just in case I get an email, I need this. So thank you very much for having us. Uh, we're, we're actually really excited uh, to have this panel because all of us, we've known each other for, for quite a while, but we never had the chance to be on a panel together. Uh, so it'll be great to uh, you know, debate some ideas, talk about uh, some uh, great stuff about quantum. Um, so I'm joined with a great panel. So myself, I'm uh, Martin Laforet. I'm the managing partner at Contaset, which is a fairly new VC fund uh, focused entirely on quantum startups. So we're one of five in the world that has this specific uh, target. We started about three months ago and we made uh, our first few investments and then we, we keep on going. Uh, to my left, I have uh, Marie-Ève Boulanger. Uh, she's a program manager at uh, Pink Square, which is uh, roughly tr translated to the uh, platform for innovation in digital and quantum of Quebec. It's, it's a center for HPC and, and quantum where they help and support enterprise in their uh, you know, uh, quantum journey. She can tell you a bit more about that. After that, we have Sarah Blanchet, who's the executive director of uh, one of the very first undergraduate degree in quantum information science at the University of Sherbrooke. Uh, then we have Julien Chausson, who's, uh, who leads the IBM Quebec partnership specifically for, uh, for quantum. Uh, IBM is one of the leading company developing uh, quantum hardware and software, creating communities. And they have also installed, uh, I think it's their fifth quantum computer outside of their premises in Bromont, just uh, 100 kilometers from here, and uh, the only one in Canada so far. So we'll talk a bit more about that. And then we have Vincent Thomaset, who's the Director of Research and uh, Partnership at Productique Quebec, which is a loosely translated a, a collegial center for technological transfer. 
and they focus on, on uh, advanced manufacturing. Uh, so the goal today, uh, we'll talk about quantum, the quantum industry. Uh, you've heard from our, uh, our friend Gislaine of Five this morning uh, from Algolab, what, what they do. So we'll still spend a little bit of time explaining what quantum is and, and how you can you or your enterprise can benefit from quantum. But we'll focus a bit more on probably one of the greatest challenges that we are facing as a nation, but also as an industry, which is the, the workforce. Uh, I personally had the chance to be an early student of quantum, uh, but now we need many of them. So we're already behind. And uh, in terms of workforce, and the industry is really just starting. So just a quick recap, quantum technology, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's multiple different technologies. You can have quantum computing, you can have quantum communication, quantum sensors, materials. So it's essentially it's technology based on quantum mechanics, which is the behavior of atoms and molecules where we're trying to uh, leverage and control those effects to create technology. Uh, today, we'll focus on quantum computing, uh, because this conference has a little slight towards the AI, so we we'll, we'll decided to focus on the computing side, but also because it's probably the most transformative technology that will come out. Uh, so why don't we get started right away? So I'll, I'll ask uh, Julien maybe uh, to give us a, you know, a, a layperson version of, like, what is quantum computing good for? And, and then, uh, like, where are we today? Uh, what, where are we going? Uh, why do we care? Uh, just give us a, 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 you know, a quick bite. Okay, so I'll try to do that. Um, quantum computing, we believe, will have an impact in three domains, uh, specifically. Uh, the first one is in uh, simulation. The nature is quantum in itself, so we better have quantum computers if we want to simulate nature and, and molecules. So that's one area. The other one is in uh, machine learning. There is a whole field called uh, quantum machine learning where we believe we'll be able to uh, break the various plateaus that classical machine learning um, might face with uh, certain data sets and algorithm. And the last domain where um, quantum will make an impact uh, is optimization. Uh, so there are complex optimization problems that uh, we hope to get a better answer actually out of quantum computers rather than uh, classical computers. So that's that the three main domains where, where we aim to have an impact. And right now, the quantum computing technology is at a stage that we call the, the we're in the quantum utility era, we call it, uh, where Quantum computing is delivering results that are really in competition with what classical can deliver. And uh, they, they, they are in this stage where each one is helping the other make, uh, make progress. And uh, we have the hope for, of course, uh, quantum to win this race, but though it will be only for certain classes of problems. And there's a statement we heard earlier that, for example, quantum computing can perform certain calculations in seconds, while classical computers would take a very long time. That can be true, but only for certain classes of problems. Uh, classical computing is not going away, but many new problems will be able to find an answer thanks to quantum computing. Okay. Thank you. So uh, now if I listen to you, Julien, there's, there's a lot of will do and might do and a lot of future stuff, right? Um, so, so maybe I'll premise in saying that right now, uh, you know, Quantum technologies is is a real industry, and what I mean by a real industry is I mean there's there's VC people that invest in companies, there's startups, there's giants that are investing. I know I've been asking Julien how many there IBM is investing. He refused to uh, tell me, so we don't know, but significant amount of, of of dollars. There are billion dollar companies. There's been IPOs, mergers, some companies disappeared. So it's a real industry. It is young, but it's a real industry. So Maybe let, let's stop talking about the future for a second, and let's talk about the present. So, so marie you, you work very closely with enterprise, which today are you know, trying to find out whether quantum computing is for them or not, or trying to, to figure out. So can you give us, maybe not like real example, because I'm sure there's confidential, uh, confidential the data there, but can you give us uh, why a company should start looking today for a technology might be, that might benefit them, not today. So, Yeah, I, 
I do like I do like your your question. Um, so I'm a physicist in by training. So I like always to say that you know. Quantum computer exists, it's happening right now, but it's still a research tool. However, uh, companies, and this is what we, we say to them when we talk to them, is that you don't want to miss the train when you know the, the real thing, the real machine that will with has that has all of those uh, promises that Julian talks about will be there. So it's really by having this in mind that, so there's, as you said, it's a real industry. There's a technology shift that is happening and you don't want to miss the boat. And I'm sure we'll talk about this later uh, after on, but it takes some time to get the training to be able to use this new technology. So it's a destructive technology. It takes some time you know, to getting used to it. Uh, not because that it's particular, particularly hard. It's just that you have to put your 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 mind or your brain in a different mindset to address problems in a new perspective or in a new way. So as you said, yes, right now we do have companies, Quebec companies or international companies that are, that are using uh, quantum computers, such as the one that is uh, in Bromo. Um However, it's it's not using it to have like those um, mind blowing, you know, uh, cutting edge, uh, like results, but it's more in this uh, training perspective. So once the big thing is there, they'll be ready. Okay. So you mentioned that it's, it's important to start getting ready early. So, so is it fair to say that if you just wait until there's a quantum, like a useful quantum computer around, uh, are you telling us that we cannot just over the weekend, just start using it? I mean, you can try. <laughs> yeah. I, I, no, you, it, it takes some time. And as I said, it's also a, a question of changing your mindset. And for companies, it, perhaps it in, involves, you know, getting new people, hiring new people, uh, training the uh, people, the decision maker. It, so it's, it's all of a shift of like, well, we have these problems. We know re very well how to solve it with classical computers. Now we need to address this, this problem that we know about on a different approach. So it, it takes time. Um, and anyone, you know, can start uh, training right now, uh, right away if they want to. So when the, sh the, the, the premises will be there, will arrive, because it will uh, arrive, they will be ready. OK. So, so which give us, I guess, the, the, the perfect segue to start uh, talking about the workforce. Uh, so I mentioned at the beginning, workforce is one of the big challenge that we have. We, we cannot hire fast enough, or we cannot uh, you know, form, pe train people fast enough. Uh, and, and here we're lucky to have uh, Sarah Blanchet, who's, uh, you know, who's leading uh, one of the very few undergraduate uh, degree in quantum. You know, just a few years ago, the people you'll see in quantum would be, you know, master degree level, PhD degree level. Uh, so, but are we still at that point? Or I should make it even bluntly. So why did you... Why did the University of Sherbrooke start an undergraduate program? And why is there, there there's not more undergraduate program out there? So I might be a tricky one there, but I'd like to hear you on that. So what are you doing in Sherbrooke? And, and do you think it's gonna be, there's going to be more of that uh, moving forward? Yeah, so Sherbrooke has been teaching, well, quantum physics for 40 years, now developed expertise in that field specifically. Um, and as just like talked this morning, we know that there's a skill force, uh, a skills gap, and we need to train more people. And so we were thinking, well, not me, but colleagues at the time, can we make a new program which isn't, you know, 10 years long? Because right now people do their bachelor's or master's or PhD, and then however many postdocs they want to do until they switch from academia to industry. And so the idea was to have a specialized training program which would take people from CJEP to industry and three years and a half, you know, after the university. So a program which is three years and a half in university and it's professionalizing. So people would be ready to integrate the workforce right after their undergrad. Um, and in science, there's like a mindset where you do a master's and a PhD. It's pretty uncommon for people to like not study after their undergrad. Um, so we built the program with all of the necessary tools for students to be able to work. Um, so that was kind of the idea behind yeah, tr uh, having a shorter program to be able to feed out more talent um, in the field. So we decided to specialize on quantum software development. Um, other universities in Australia, for example, are teaching quantum engineering, but we're really the only program focused on quantum software worldwide. So 
I'll be able to tell you a bit more about how successful it is in a few years since it just launched um, last year. So students are in their second year. Oh, second cohort. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, basically, so we were looking for students who like physics, math, and computer science, three pillars of quantum computing. So we have interesting profiles. Um, and why other universities aren't building curriculums like that, there's a lot of papers around the literature talking about quantum education and how to, te how to best teach quantum. Um, and it's a challenge. I mean, would you rather take someone who's been working in computer science for many years and retrain them or have new talent specifically trained in quantum computing. Um, so it's an open question. Some programs are just focusing to keep majors in physics and computer science and have some minors so people are quantum aware but are not like quantum specialists. Mm -hmm. um, I think more and more we're going to see more programs, but I think people are still, it's still kind of risky. You know, quantum is still to be seen how it's, if it's going to happen as big as we predict it will be. So is it worth it to invest a lot of resources to build a new program. We thought it was worth it. Perhaps others are a bit more scared in that yeah. sense. I think that would be the main reason. So why, so you mentioned, right? You, you focus on soft quantum software development. There's other places that focus on hardware. Uh, you know, I can claim here we need everyone. Uh, why specifically did you, did Sherbrooke choose uh, software development? Um, I think the answer was that, well, we already, I mean, the physics program at the university is very experimental. So most of the professors are working on exper experimental physics uh, in the quantum computing field. And so I think there was a gap in software at the university and we have more and more professors coming into algorithm research, but it's still a pretty small team. And right now, I mean, there's obviously needs in hardware and software in the industry, but software is gonna be more and more prevalent. You know, it's gonna be very important. And also, I mean, these students, if ever quantum, you know, doesn't show up, well, they can just transition to computer science or data analysis or AI without a problem. So I think that was part of the reasoning. All right. Uh, Vanessa, I'll, I'll turn to you. So uh, often when we, we hear the word, you know, quantum, first of all, our head goes in the cloud. And then we think, you know, physicists, engineers, lab codes, big clunky uh, labs, things doesn't work. Uh, duct tape, the whole thing. Uh, I went to visit Productive Quebec. You know, you guys are dealing with CNC machine, lathe, like you're, you're doing advanced manufacturing. Uh, so one might not associate that with quantum, but here you are. So, so tell us, like, where uh, uh, advanced manufacturing people or more like technical hands-on people, where do they fit in this whole equation? Yeah, that's a, a good one. But it's all about um, technology transfer and adoption. I mean, uh, either it's automation, industry 4.0, or quantum. They all face the same uh, adoption challenges. Um, I have to say, although quantum is disruptive, it will still rely on uh, manufacturing technology to create, design, produce, and support uh, this technology. And Productic Quebec involvement in the quantum zone was uh, in two axes. The first one was to develop the expertise for prototyping and help uh, people that are creating uh, quantum technology to industrialize it. So we worked with a company we help them to uh, redesign their mechanical parts for their uh, sensor. And by doing so, we uh, help to save like a third um, of the cost for their uh, prototype production. And uh, we got rid of a lot of manufacturing um, uh, tasks that needed to be really precise and a lot of assembly manipulation by uh, streamlining their design, they have a more, more robust product now. That's the first uh, axis. And the second axis we work on is to um, help to bring enabling technologies in the region to be able to support a quantum supply chain. So to do so, we need to bring the technology to build the knowledge about those technology and then have people trained on that. And not only at the university uh, uh, level, but we need to, um, to bring the, uh, sorry, the vocational training and the education schools as well and the college. So we need to have some kind of continuum throughout the training in order to have a real 
um, supply chain supported in the region. So we feel that if we bring the proper technology and the proper know-how, we will have uh, something really special in Sherbrooke supporting quantum. Okay. Uh, so continuum of education, bringing, you mentioned vocational technician. I think it's, it's uh, I'll go back to you, Julien. So uh, IBM, you guys have a massive team. Of, of people working on your effort in quantum from, well, we don't know really, but yeah, PhD level, you have a uh, master undergrad technician. Uh, like typically, like would you say your team is, do you need to have a quantum background to join a quantum effort or there's place for, or for other things? Like if I want to join in, like do I need to go back to school, learn quantum mechanics? Or, you know, a bit like Vincent was mentioning, like, we need the skills anyway. So it depends, mm. is the answer. Um, so you, you, if you want to do, for example, some, some qu quantum computing, usually, yes, we're going to look for, or, or even building a quantum computer, yes, we're going to look for, of course, the, 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 the right skills. But quantum is creating, creating tons of jobs. Uh, that are going to support the technology that would require you would require you to have some, of course, technology affinity, but would not require you to know to have, for example, deep knowledge in in Qiskit. Um, and I'm I'm actually a great example of that. Uh, when when IBM hired me, the only thing I knew about quantum was how to spell it, um, and. Um, I, I, I learned um, they have a, an excellent uh, training program, internal and external. Um, most of the content is actually free on the IBM Quantum platform. Anybody who has a pulse in the audience can actually start using a quantum computer before the end of the day. Um, you won't do something utility with it by the end of the day, but you can start using it. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you, you don't need to have deep expertise to start showing interest and supporting the industry, whether you want to support it Business-wise, on the legal side, on the finance side, like there are tons of aspects where quantum needs help to uh, for the industry to really grow. Well, actually, I think I'll, I'll take the opportunity and I'll push on 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 that. So, so far, we've talked a lot about the, the technical aspect, and there is definitely a big technical part, right? Scientists, engineers. Uh, but for the people here in the room and, and online, if they're not from technical, if they are, you know, you mentioned legal, marketing, like... Can they join the adventure and, and how? And uh, do we need them or are we going to need them? Like, uh, and this question is open to everyone. Like for, for the non-tech people, is there an opportunity now or soon? And, and what, what does it look like? I think there is a strong opportunity now. I mean, the number of companies that are starting to explore and adopt quantum, whether large corporations or the, and you are very well aware of that, the startup landscape is growing extremely fast in the quantum world. Well, all these companies, you know, they, they, they need all this support system to be operating and growing. And so you can make an impact in quantum, joining a quantum company tomorrow. Well, depends on the lens of their recruitment process, but tomorrow uh, virtually. If I can just add, you know, I think the beauty of quantum computing is that it's very multidisciplinary. And so even, and you can learn everything, you know, like whether you're, even if you're not in school, like obviously work, you, you learn when you work. And so just like, you know, in my old team, we had mathematicians and physicists and computer scientists, but nobody came in with a deep understanding of quantum computing. You know, we all learned on the job. And so I think for, I mean, for people with science backgrounds, it's like very realistic to join a company and to learn about quantum computing while you're working. And for people in HR or legal, like obviously there's a bunch of opportunities for companies in quantum who are looking for non-technical people, but who can contribute in a different way, but in a useful way um, in different quantum companies. Um, perhaps as you said at the beginning, so quantum, the field of quantum technologies is very, very broad. So you don't have to be a specific expert that's in quantum algorithm to be able to, to work in that field. And we, we do need the help of peop experienced people from different backgrounds to learn from the past mistakes. So take AI, for example, it's been like 20 years that now this is a, I keep saying it's a brand new thing, but you know, we, we the technology is disrupted 
disruptive. It's happening at the moment, but we're still having some legal issues or, or ethical questions. Uh, why don't we learn from, from that and say, okay, well, can we have people interested in, their, in those questions and want to trans, uh, transfer those skills to quantum? So we address those issues that might happen in the future, but right now. So when we are ready, then it's, at least we'll have some, some answers. And maybe jumping on Marie-Ève's point, like at the university, we have a professor of applied political science who is working on the ethics of quantum computing. So, you know, you're, she's not at all technical, but she learned enough to be able to start asking the questions of, you know, what are the dangers of quantum computing, how we can address it for it to be integrated nicely in the society. And well, maybe, so, so we all you know, touched that, that part a little bit, is, is the idea of uh, you know, rescaling or, or upscaling. Okay, so we're missing people, so we cannot wait for people to graduate. We need people now. Uh, so let's say I'm a, you know, a, a programmer or a, an electrical engineer, and then I'm, I'm online or I'm here in the room. I'm absolutely amazed by what we're talking about on stage, and I want to join. Like, how? Do I just go and try to pretend that I know quantum? Like, uh, do I go knock and hope somebody uh, believes in me? Like, what are the opportunities today to maybe upskill either on my own or is there a program? And maybe I'll, I'll put you on the spot, Vincent, because you're, uh, you're, you're sort of in the middle of this right now, right? So you have a background that was nothing to do with quantum. You're, you're manufacturing. Now you're, you know, your organization is slowly getting in. So you're learning as you go. So yeah. uh, Well, it, it's all about the enabling technology. So we have to be aware of uh, what technology needs to be um, developed and put in place to support all those quantum initiatives and the new technology that are uh, going to be um, needed to develop sensors, to uh, machine particular materials. And this all needs to be um, developed, the risk, uh, bring the knowledge and then transfer that to the new uh, the, the new people that will uh, uh, operate those machines. So it, it's all on the ground side, but it will support. And after that, all the uh, maintenance of those equipment, we need to be able to operate the maintenance locally for those mm -hmm. high-tech uh, equipment as well. So we need those, um, um, I always forgot uh, the formation continue. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. continue to, to to upskill uh, people that have basic knowledge about those technology and bring them to know that particular technology that supports quantum. So, Maria, I, I assume you know at Pink that you know you, you're helping enterprise in their quantum journey. So, I presume that these enterprises have no prior quantum knowledge. So, you're right in it. So, how? Like how hard it is, or how realistic it is for. A you know, a programmer, an engineer, or somebody who doesn't have the quantum background to really get in, learn, learn to a point where they can then be useful to a quantum company or another company looking into, like, how they, they can get the useful skills without having to do a five, 10 year degree. Yeah, um, it, it's an excellent question. So um, one of the things I, I like doing when, when speaking with companies is to say, well, are you interested in, within the academic partnership? Because we, as I said at the beginning, it's still a research tool. Um, and academics, most of the talents are within uh, the, the academia. So by having you know, a joint project, that can be something that is more stimulating. Because you need to, yes, you have to be interested. You say, OK, well, I want to start now. Fine, perfect, we're going to help you, but you need to have, I believe, a concrete idea of our project to at least keep moving into the right mm. direction. Um, so that can be you know, a, a, a great first step. And then in, in question of how long does it take, I would depend, it depends on um, how good you're at, you're at, at learning. Are you doing this full-time or, or part-time? Do you need to build a, a team internally? Uh, will you dedicate a full-time you know, resource to this project and then hire some intern, interns around this? So typically building a good project, it might take a, a year or two. Uh, and I would say at least minimum you know, six months training uh, before you know, being able to think on your own about uh, how to implement you know, quantum algorithms uh, for them to be, to be useful. So what if I'm on my own? What if my like it has nothing to do with my current job, but I want to learn on my own so I can maybe do a career shift or something? Like, what are is there anything 
online so, course, whatever. Like, what what's offered? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the um, so IBM Quantum offers a learning platform, and we have massive content. You'll probably never go through it all, and that's perfectly fine. But eighty percent of it is completely free. So essentially, if you're smart, you can become self-taught in quantum. Um, and I, I want to underline that because the, the largest quantum user of IBM quantum systems in, in Canada is a person that learned quantum alone. Just using that, that content that is, that is online. And they are the largest user in Canada. I, I think it's also the largest per, um, in the world, but I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure of that, but one of the largest. So like you, you can do it if you're smart. Okay. I think like the good news is that there's, like Junia said, there's IBM Quantum, which is how I first heard about quantum computing. I was studying physics, but even then it was a board day in summer. I came across the IBM Quantum platform and that's how I discovered quantum computing. But um, yeah, I feel like there's so much content online. It's and there's hackathons, there's competitions, and it's all open source. So there's many ways to contribute to the community and there's Slack channels and like, there's a really big community in quantum. So I think it's really easy for anybody who's interested to join. Mm -hmm. There's a tons of different ways. Maybe I'll add the, the moderator uh, note on this. Uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot of content online. You can, you can learn a lot very quickly. There's also a lot of garbage online. So make sure that you get your source from reputable source. You know, IBM, uh, you know, com there's a lot of companies that, that offer. So IBM was probably one of the pioneers in this. But you know, if we look at a Canadian company like Xanadu, uh, Rigetti, uh, so most of either the software or the hardware quantum computing company have some sort of learning platform. Uh, be very, very careful with YouTube. Uh, there's a lot of bad or or missing i wouldn't say misinformation but wrong information so uh yeah, but there's a lot of legit stuff uh, i think there's coursera edX also that have online like massive online uh MOOCs, they're called yeah yep. and, and if i i can add to that um, i'm not sure you were going to to go into that direction but <laughs> go, go no, for but it also don't be shy of saying that you don't have the competency at the moment. Like, don't don't bullshit because people will will know. Um, just say like, here's what I am. This is where I want to go. And most companies are are willing because we don't have that many, you know, uh, qualified people within the field to say, okay, well, we're taking you. We're giving you, you know, six months to get updated. And if you're serious about doing this transition shift, you'll be okay. But don't mm -hmm. don't bullshit. <laughs> right. Yeah. We, we, we the, as a community, I think we've developed a pretty good bullshit detector in the last decade. A lot of, a lot of people tried, many failed. Uh, so I'm gonna bring this discussion maybe in a, in a, in a different direction. Uh, so it was mentioned before. So quantum computing and actually any other quantum technology, it's a it's very multidisciplinary. So uh, at the technical level, it's a mix of there's engineering, there's math, computer science, physics, all of those fields which are very recognized for their diversity, uh, sarcasm. Um, so, so right off the bat, I mean, you know, we're hitting with four fields that are doing pretty poorly when it comes to diversity of whether it's, it's gender, ethnicity, uh, diverse, even diversity of thought sometimes. Uh, so let's bring a discussion there. Um, like, Open to all. Like, do you see how how can the field of quantum maybe uh, help, or are we doing uh, concrete things to to encourage uh, diversity, you know, at the workplace and the people coming in, going out, that, that sort of thing? So, floor is open. If I can just bridge back to the previous point, I think the fact that there's so much online content makes it a very inclusive space because there's like let's say there's a thing called Girls in Quantum, which is a community of thousands of women who are like under 20 years old who are interested in quantum computing and they have this big community and they have mentors and meetings. And so there's so much stuff online. Anybody can join in. And I think on that sense, on the inclusive side, it's it's great. Then they still need to find a job and to have a safe space to work in. But to the recruiting part and to like spreading the word about quantum, I think like the community at large, it has very like, um, like a sense of wanting to be open and to spread the good news. And, you know, to you know, IBM is huge on that, like with Kiskit and YouTube videos about how to find a job in quantum. And so I think on that sense, like it's very inclusive, but there's still work to be done in having women 
in the field. And I think Maria, if you can talk about that. Yeah, I, I can continue. Um, I can continue on that. So I would say that you're completely right, and that's the beauty of of, of today is that you can connect with people that have you know, the, you're within their same group, even though, you know, there's not sitting next to you. So this community building is very, very important. Um, I would say, and we all heard about this, but representation does matter. Um, so when you're, you're, I don't know, you're a startup and you're starting, you know, to, to build your company and recruit, and recruit people, it's really easy to go and see the, always the same person you're talking to because you have this connection. But when you think about your future, you say, okay, well, in a year, I need to have 10 employees. In two years, 20 em employees, because your investors are pushing you, you know, in that direction. Now it's the right time to think about this because then when you put photo on your website, it's going to be all white men. And you're, you're basically, you know, you done. Um, it has been shown that representation does matter because when you're looking for a job and you go and see at the people's face, you say, oh, well, that person looks like me. Uh, I might have a friend at that company and that's our important things to do. Um, you want to add on to GA? Yeah, so we, we talked about girls in quantum, but there are also women in quantum. So there are already many initiatives that are um, started actually in the field of quantum. And I think that's great because they're very proactive as we're just starting to build the workforce. They are already there, already existing to make sure we, we promote diversity um, through multiple angles. Um, so we, we won't play catch up like in other fields like you named before. So that's a, that's a great thing. The other thing is, as, as I said earlier, you need to be smart. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's wherever your origin, beliefs, uh, gender, doesn't matter. Um, you need to be smart because that's what we need right now in the field and we already lack workforce, even if we're just at the beginning. So um, that's, I think that's the only criteria. All right. So. We're getting close to uh, the end, uh, and I would like to uh, you know, take some time to get some uh, some questions from the audience. So maybe as a as a finish finishing question, maybe we can broaden our horizon a little bit, and let's look down the future, and and to make sure that everybody can say something. We don't cover all the subject for with the first two. Can you tell us? one challenge and one opportunity that we can see moving forward as, as a community, as an industry, and let's, let's try to think like large. Aha. Um, the, the one challenge is, so we've all heard about the lack of talent in AI recently, right? Um, when quantum will be ready, you'll think back about these years, uh, we've not seen anything yet <laughs> in terms of lacking workforce. So these type of events are extremely important. Uh, but the opportunity lies really, I believe, in, in, in quantum computing. This is an untapped opportunity, uh, yet completely uh, under, undervalued uh, compared to, um, to the hardware. So uh, there is a lot of room for uh, go-getters to, uh, to actually achieve something big. I should have been clear, it's, it's one challenge in opportunity per person. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, that's good. So uh, Maria, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, so one challenge. Um, okay, I'll go with, with this one. So um, as, as we said, Quantum computers, they are there, it's available. You can you can go online. Some of, the, of them are accessible to, to clouds. And a challenge that we do see at the moment is thinking about problems that needs a lot of qubits. Um, because once the technology will be there, uh, we want to use it to its full potential. So I would say that's, that's one challenge. One opportunity is um, if you have a great idea, it's still time to start your business. And now you know, Martin, um, it's still time, you know, to the, te the Technological choice are not set in stone at the moment. So yeah, we have those leaders that are huge, you know, um, mostly American corporation that have made some choices, but there's still opportunities for any type of startup that have this great idea that say, okay, well, I think my idea is good. And if this works, it's going to, to show, well, go for it. Yep. yep. Sarah? I guess my challenge would be, um, well, to have it um, in the hands of, as many people as possible, so not to have very few companies, very few countries who have access to this technology and you know, it might be not the most ethical or the most fair way to go, but the opportunity is, well, I mean, and another challenge would be to find like some useful applications for quantum computing, kind of as Maria is saying, that are gonna be just and which are gonna bring the world in a good direction. And 
the opportunity. So people are saying, oh yeah, quantum is gonna solve climate change and you know it's gonna solve all these problems, but I think it can allow us to take a step back and that we can't rely on technology to save us and it just has to come from individuals. But kind of as a reminder that, yeah, okay, like it's not realistic to just wish upon technology to, to save us. So I guess that's my opportunity. All right. Baisa? I would say is to uh, how can we support uh, quantum technologies from the idea to the commercialized product? Uh, this is the challenge. How do we make sure that we can support that? And the opportunity is if we do uh, have that supply chain will be so much attractive in Canada for other companies from around the world to come here and get their product developed and supported here. Well, thank you to the four of you. I think uh, I'm going to borrow a couple of minutes from lunchtime. Uh, feel free to, uh, to go if you're really hungry. But if you have any question in the audience, please uh, raise your hand. I think there's a mic uh, going around. We'll be more than happy to uh, answer. I'll bring it over to you. Yeah, we've got about five, 10 minutes for questions. Yeah, thank you. The, the question is for everyone. Um, um, first, when you, you start in the, um, in the industry of quantum, there's, um, there's a lot of players and it's, uh, it's quite complex to understand who does what and everything. Um, and when I started, I addressed that industry like I did with the internet. And uh, the reflexes, the, big, the business practices and are quite different in that industry. There's uh, a culture for the quantum industry. And I'd like to hear you on that. Um, the, the best example I've had was from the uh, Institut Quantique the, and others. They, they wrote the, the, the PDF uh, Quantum Potential, Le Potentiel Quantique, which is an amazing intro introduction to the industry. But if you could comment on the, the culture that you'd like to build and what you'd like to see in the industry would be useful. Thank you. Yep. So uh, essentially, let's talk a bit about the culture uh, within the quantum community, which, you know, is... is still small but definitely growing at a uh, i think an exponential rate would be a fair uh, fair statement so please uh, go ahead and chime in nope. <laughs> microphone missing um yeah so uh, in terms of culture i think that uh, you know we are we're building a culture that's really forward thinking uh right now um and we talked about it also like we 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 try to not repeat the mistakes we've seen in the past. Mm. So uh, you'll see a lot of people from the quantum industry trying to tame the hype that can get around it. Quantum is not magic. It's not gonna solve every problems in the world. It's gonna have very concrete and precise applications where it's gonna make a tremendous change, but for only those areas. Um, and, and we try to, of course, make it as, uh, as inclusive as we can right from the start. Want to add anything? Well, I can add, uh, now I can give opinions. I don't, uh, that's right. <laughs> the moderations. The, uh, uh, maybe I'll, um, I'll take a slightly different, different tangent. Uh, so I've been involved in quantum, I think, uh, for more years than those four combined. So I've, I've been around for a long time. I've been there since 2003 when quantum was, I joined in, it was a cool science, there was cool stuff. Um, I'm a physicist, so I enter, as every physicist, you don't enter physics to get a job, but to do cool science. We knew that there was a potential eventually. I would never have thought that I would be sitting here as a venture capitalist uh, 25 years later, but here we are. So where I'm going with this is, the community was very academic, right? It was an academic adventure. It was very, very heavily science-based. And then around the 2010s, 15, that's where little startups started showing up, right? And then there was some complete garbage startup. And then there was a, the hype started. And then there was a lot of uncalled for hype. And there was people coming out from nowhere making absolutely stupid claims. Like those people never took the time to read one article about quantum. So the quantum community, I think, is, is not closed off. I think it's, it's, um, it looks at the outside with a, uh, you're welcome, but don't bullshit me. Okay, it's because we've, we've been bullshitted before. We've had some people with lots of influence, with zero knowledge, going out that have a huge tribune, 
and then essentially making us look bad because they're making claims that are just absolutely uh, crazy. Like Ghislaine this morning mentioned, uh, temper the, uh, uh, manage the expectation because so much has been put on the back of quantum, like this new magical pill. Um, and a good example was AI, right? In the early days of quantum, where we go back maybe in 2010-ish, there was a very short intellectual shortcut that was like, well, AI lacks computing. Quantum computing offers this unimaginable amount of computing. Of course, it's going to work together. And that went on for a couple of years. Lots of money got wasted. And then we realized, no, that's not true. And then a few years later, we, then we realized, actually, maybe quantum can help. But we had you know, some theory behind that. And then it started all over again. Now it's a bit more educated, but there's still a lot of hype. So the community is very welcoming. We need a lot of people. Just don't bullshit and don't pretend. We prefer to, you know, to welcome you as a newbie and, and embrace you and then bring you in. Then you come in thinking that you know everything because we don't even know everything. And that's our, that, that's our stuff. So maybe a slightly different uh, tangent on this. Just come in, own up to what you don't know, and you'll be most welcome. We have uh, time for one more. So I see a hand up. I'll run over there. Here you are, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. This is a very interesting discussion. I was wondering, in, in your opinions uh, for the future, are the problems that will be best approached using the qubit uh, structure, will they be those that are uh, Prob that, that show some high degree of probabilistic determinism? Or uh, do you think that qubits will be able to be applied more generally and uh, there won't be that type of uh, structural requirement? So uh, let's, we talked a little bit about that. Maybe let's revisit it uh, a little bit more in detail. So uh, I guess in a nutshell, what will a quantum computer be good for? Like what do we know now is going to be good for or not good for? Uh, will everyone have a quantum computer on their laptop? Uh, no, on their lap in a couple of years. Like, uh, let's let's try to see, like, really, what is a damn quantum computer, and who needs it to do what? Yeah, I, I can start with that. Thank you for 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 your question. So, um, as you said, Martin, so. I don't believe everyone will have a quantum computer within their 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 home, uh, just because of um, how we make those and the, the specificity of the qubits by by themselves or how we control them. Um, however, uh, everyone in the future can have access to it through the clouds. And as as Julia said uh, previously, quantum computers will be good for very specific domains of application and very specific problems. Uh, so we want concrete, yeah, like what problem? What problem exactly? So for all of the molecular like drug discovery. Uh, what better way to use the nature by itself to stimulate nature? Um, so there's a lot of potential in that field. Uh, development of new quantum materials with, uh, like for example, the superconducting field is also a promising uh, area. All of the optimization problems. So optimization problems gather a lot of data that with a lot of parameters. That's one way. Uh, it's not nature. It's not necessarily a quantum problems, but uh, because of the complexity of the problems, quantum computers has the potential to better you know, solve them. Um, I can perhaps let the hands to my colleagues or just add quickly, like there's many different types of qubits in the field. So there's a company, for example, who's based on neutral atom qubits and their architecture is specifically good for optimization problems, as Marie have mentioned. So because you can physically place the qubits in specific locations, it can accurately represent a physical map of, let's say, you want to place some Starbucks in a city. So in that sense, like there is a, there could be a link between qubits, like in your, in your nature, and a link to the problem. But I feel like in general, there are like, as Marie have said, there's going to be many different field applications, but not necessarily in relation to the structure of the qubits themselves. That was kind of your question. For for that type of question, I always like to give sort of two two answers. Uh, so one of them is there's a lot of things where we know it's going to help that's been mentioned here. There's a lot of places where we know it's not going to help, and there, but most places we still don't know. 
So, so it's still because quantum computing is a entirely different way of computing. Uh, there's still many, many, many classes of problem where we don't know if it's going to help or not. So there's a lot of innovation to be had. There's a lot of research. Like there's still a lot of meat on the bone. And the reality is like, you, you look at, project you back in the 1970s. That was the same thing with the regular computers that was using vacuum tube. We knew what they were good for. We knew what they were not good for, but we would never imagine that right now I'd be talking to a camera who will be going on the net and then it will be, uh, you know, encoded in a way. We never thought of this or it was possible. So, and it's not us that's going to think of this. That will be our, our kids and our, our kids' kids, like the generation that grew up with it, that really is going to unleash the, 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 the power of quantum. But there's one thing that we know for sure that is theoretically proven, quantum computer is more powerful than traditional computing. This is theoretically proven. Now, that doesn't tell you how to build it. And that doesn't tell you what you can do with it. And this is what communities, company, uh, students, that's, that's, that's the opportunity we have uh, in front of us. I had another thing I wanted to say, but I forgot, so. That means I, I got too involved. hungry, it's time for lunch. <laughs> okay. A round of applause, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well done. Cheers. All right. Um, so for um, all of you folks that are online, we are about to sign off, but I wanted to let you know that we will be opening a quote unquote Zoom room for you to uh, network with some of the fellow online participants. So we do invite you there. Um, for the folks that are in person, we do invite you to join us for lunch uh, just outside. And following lunch, uh, we're having sort of two networking events. Um, at about 1.30, a group of students will come and join us. So I hope that you will um, chat with them and inspire them. And from 2.30 to 4.30, we have a networking event which is sponsored by Seawell. Uh, so I just wanted to wrap up by thanking all of our speakers and all of the folks that traveled to be at Future, Tech Nation's Future Wave 2024 here in Montreal. And again, uh, just wanted to acknowledge all of our sponsors, <laughs> certainly the Government of Canada um, and their Student Work Placement Program, uh, Versatil, Seawell, Interac, Kindrel, and uh, Queer Tech. Uh, signing off for this year, and we'll see you in 2025.